giant howling vortex of thunder and rain, spreading its spiral arms in a destructive embrace. It can reach more than a thousand kilometers. I feel like we've lost our city. This is a tropical cyclone. It's just this massive roar, and it hits like a freight train. The winds can be deadly, but the storm surge even worse. I got nothing left. My initial impression was just one of complete and utter devastation. It makes it a huge humanitarian problem and a huge technical problem. Just how do you clean up this? As storms intensify and urban populations explode, we're more at risk than ever before. Hurricanes are getting more intense and longer lasting. The casualties more or less 10,000. Sifting through the wreckage of some of the world's biggest disasters, we can find the clues to predicting and surviving one of the most extraordinary forces of nature. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind, as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? The southeastern states of the US are famous for their laid-back lifestyle, cradling the warm blue waters of the Gulf of Mexico. But the tropics attract more than just beachgoers and tourists. They're the breeding ground of some of the world's most ferocious cyclones. We're just trying to get as far away from here as possible. So in different parts of the world, they call it different things. In Australia, it's called a cyclone. In uh, USA, it's called a hurricane. In Mexico, it's called a huracan. In East Asia, it's called a typhoon, but it's all the same thing. Hurricane Katrina was born as a tropical depression. On August 23rd, 2005, just near the Bahamas. When these cyclones form in tropical areas, they get what's known as a warm core. So the air rises up around it and then starts to sink, hence forming the eye of a cyclone. High rates of evaporation drive the movement of warm, moist air up into the atmosphere. So the oceans need to be around about 27 degrees Celsius and you need upper atmospheric conditions to be favorable to allow that air to rise and then diverge or spread out. A lot of it has to do with low wind shear, meaning that there's no strong winds at different levels of the atmosphere. There are no major damages so far, mainly tree debris and power lines that were blown down. Warm waters are the fuel source of tropical cyclones. As the air at the ocean surface moves upwards, pressure drops and more moist, warm air is sucked in to replace it, creating a vortex of intense winds. As cyclones travel over tropical waters, they can rapidly intensify and grow. It was after Katrina traversed South Florida and came out over the Gulf of Mexico where there were some very uh, high sea surface temperatures that it began to really develop. You have an obligation to yourself and your family to haul ass and get out of here. And I'm telling you, get out now. In the Gulf, Katrina morphed into a monster. 
with winds surpassing 175 kilometers an hour. It's better to be safe than sorry, and I'd rather prepare early than be without when the time comes. Hurricane Katrina was a massive storm. At one point, it was a Category 5, and it filled the entire Gulf of Mexico. Katrina then went through a distinctive transformation before it reached the coast. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. So you have these spiral armbands that, that uh, sort of wrap around the storm. And if the spiral armband gets wrapped around so much, it can actually shut off the eye wall. And then the old eye wall dies and a new eye wall forms. This is one of the processes that makes the storm bigger. Katrina weakened to a category three, but grew in size. And it stopped intensifying, and then it just started to spread out. And the wind field became very large at that point. Nestled on the banks of Lake Pontchartrain, Louisiana's biggest city, New Orleans, was directly in the eye's path. If you look out and you see the level of the lake and look at the houses, the lake is above the houses. A mandatory evacuation order was executed, the first in the history of the city. Residents were given plenty of warning. A big one was coming. But nothing prepared them for what was in store. The estimates are that somewhere between 100 to 120,000 residents of the city of New Orleans either could not evacuate or chose not to evacuate in advance of Katrina's landfall. Katrina was sort of two disasters at once. So there was a sort of traditional hurricane disaster that happened on the Mississippi coast. Mississippi was to the right of the center. The winds were blowing onshore and they had an unbelievable storm surge that inundated all those coastal towns. New Orleans was on the western side of the center. And there, wind was blowing from Lake Pontchartrain into the city. When the storm surge flooded into Lake Pontchartrain, the levees couldn't take the strain. So when they gave way, there was really nothing to stop the water from just pouring in. My understanding is most of the people drowned one way or another. It was the water inundation that killed people. Storm surge is one of the most deadly effects of tropical cyclones. Although Hurricane Katrina weakened to a Category 3 before landfall, its enormous size displaced huge volumes of water. We saw tidal surges, water, cover things that just amazed me. One of the things that really blew my mind about Katrina was how much of the U.S. coast had impacts. Basically from Louisiana almost to the Florida Panhandle had sustained hurricane force winds. This was a four-story condo complex with parking underneath. <sighs> Send a lot of help. Storm surge prone area like the Northern Gulf, you start piling up a lot of water along the coast and uh, carrying a lot of water with the center of the storm. In the end, it affected an area of land of about 90,000 square miles, which is about the size of Great Britain. Six, five, Tropical cyclones are most easily studied from space. 
and NASA has an arsenal of sophisticated instruments to help track and predict their formation and path. The Terra and Aqua satellites analyze rainfall rates, temperature and humidity, as well as surface wind speed, cloud height, and ocean heat. Closer to the ground, hurricane hunters carry out riskier missions. So the mission purpose today is to stay in the environment as long as humanly possible. Storm penetration is done by Air Force C-130, as well as the P-3 aircraft from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And the flight tracks are designed to find the center, and you're not gonna find the center unless you actually go to the center, and that means penetrating the eye wall. While the eye wall of the storm contains the strongest winds of the cyclone, the center, the eye itself, is an oasis of calm. The eye of a hurricane is one of the most surreal experiences. To get into the eye, you've got to get through the worst part of the storm. So you're shell-shocked from this constant roaring of wind. And all of a sudden it's calm. You can dash outside quickly if you want to, but then you can hear the return eye wall coming. Hard to believe this is a street. Isn't it? And it hits like a freight train. Cyclones are rated according to their wind speeds. In the Western Hemisphere, they use a classification called the Saffir-Simpson scale. Between 120 and 150 kilometers per hour, hurricanes are a category one. At category three, the level of Hurricane Katrina, major damage is expected. Trees will be uprooted and large-scale destruction of infrastructure may occur. The highest rating is Category 5. It's applied to any hurricane over 251 kilometers an hour. Little can withstand this type of hurricane. The number of the Saffir Simpson scale is related to wind only, and it really doesn't convey the entire threat. There are many other threats associated with it that sometimes are proportional to that scale and sometimes not. Cyclones don't need to be large to create massive, deadly storm surges. Take Super Typhoon Haiyan, the fiercest tropical cyclone to ever make landfall. In 2013, it hit Tacloban City in the Philippines at a Category 5 rating. The most severe wind category possible. More than 6,000 people were killed. Please contact this number so that we can also get him. The media and people have a way of confusing the intensity of a storm with the size. So they say that super typhoon Haiyan was really large. Actually, it was the opposite. It was a very small typhoon, but it was very intense. That Philippine Sea area, if there's a bathtub of hot water on the planet, that, that is the place. The sea surface temperature where Haiyan formed was around 30 degrees Celsius. With a lack of wind shear, there was nothing to slow it down. Winds were measured at a sustained speed of 305 kilometers per hour. But momentary gusts reached 380. but it was hard for anything to actually report a wind in that kind of environment. Almost no measurement device will withstand that. So it's kind of hard to tell. Haiyan smashed into the Philippines at near peak intensity, with 25 million people in its path. So I picked a hotel right in the center of the city, a big concrete hotel, and that's where I decided to hunker down for this typhoon. 
and the wind's starting to make that moaning sound. I think maybe we're just starting to get in the cyclone circulation. It was utter devastation. Uh, Takloban almost was wiped off the map. It starts out, it's just windy, rainy, messy weather, and then it gets worse and worse. And finally, when you get into the inner core of the hurricane, or what we call the eye wall, that's when things go nuts. The building is getting torn apart. The eye wall is the area of strongest winds, right at the center of the cyclone, where moisture-filled air is rushing upwards at phenomenal speeds. The rain is so heavy and the wind is so violent that everything just turns white. It's a whiteout. Debris flying everywhere. I mean, stuff smashing into buildings. The kind of stuff that if it hit you, it would kill you instantly. Tacloban City is on the tip of a peninsula at the top of a very narrow bay. And what happened was the center passed south of the city, then the winds shifted to the southeast. It basically had all this wind forcing all of this water into this narrow bay. And then all of a sudden it just overflowed into the city and it swept the entire downtown area. It was literally like a tsunami. And it happened so fast that thousands couldn't get out of the way in time. We have an estimate given on the casualties, more or less 10,000. Nothing was ever like Haiyan, and I have not seen anything like it since. To see a city of 220,000 people just destroyed, whole city blocks just gone, piles of rubble, bodies in the streets. Of course, you expect to see emergency services, first responders out, you know, helping people who were injured or rendering aid. Uh, that was not the case here. Sa mga news, sabi daw, meron ng mga relief. But sadly, walang dumadating sa amin. Magnitude of this catastrophe was so huge that that society was paralyzed. There are no sirens, there's no traffic through the streets. Well, there can't be because the, the streets are blocked with wreckage. There's just desperate residents trying to dig through the rubble. It is one of the saddest, most awful things I've ever seen. A complete breakdown of infrastructure, of, of just basic city services, hospitals overflowing with injured people. I never saw something so grim or desperate. Haiyan was just, it's, it's burned in my memory. Almost one million people in the Philippines were made homeless by the disaster. As shortages of food, water, and medicines drove the population to despair. Thousands stormed the local airport on November 12th. They broke down fences, struggling to board planes. Aid trucks were attacked and their food stolen. It's chaotic. I don't know where to go. We don't know where to go to get any food. Troops were sent in and a curfew put in place to try to restore order. A week after the cyclone hit, Takloban began the terrible task of burying their dead. Bodies lined the foreshores of the wrecked city to be photographed, labeled, and buried in a mass grave. This happens a lot of places in the world where there are lots of poor uh, regions the structures are not well well constructed and they don't last at all. And the people, if they are able to get out, they have nowhere to go. In a situation like this, nothing is fast enough. The need is massive, the need is immediate because everybody, all at the same time, uh, is hungry. All at the same time have no water, all at the same time have no communication, no power. And so it makes it a huge humanitarian problem 
a huge technical problem, just how do you clean up this? What do you rebuild? There are pictures of weeks and months later in, in Taco Band of complete devastation still there. It was very hard to gather the resources to begin the cleanup and the rebuilding process. The resources were just not there. The day after Hurricane Katrina passed, residents across the Gulf states emerged to assess the damage. Although spared a direct hit, the worst was yet to come for New Orleans. The water just come up, I mean, just out of nowhere. And everybody here was trying to head for higher ground, and there is no higher ground. Some of those people who didn't evacuate because they didn't think the hurricane was going to be as bad as it was, they weren't necessarily wrong because much of the flooding and destruction that happened in New Orleans was because of the levee system that failed. Until the levees were repaired and Lake Pontchartrain tamed, the city would remain submerged. The sand layer was three quarters of the way up to the ceiling which showed us that it was a phenomenal force of water going through those houses. The debris doubled in its size, so it's only a matter of time for the levee to completely disintegrate in front of us. The levees were designed and built by the US Army Corps of Engineers to protect the city from flooding. But even they knew its limitations. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had done experiments on these levees in the 1980s and knew that the type of levees that they had built would burst once the water got up to a certain level. Within 24 hours, there were more than 28 reported breaches of the flood barriers. Not all of them collapsed. Some of them didn't meet up with other parts of the, the canal walls because one part was owned by one government department, another part was owned by another government department, and they didn't see eye to eye for various bureaucratic reasons, and so they never joined them. So then some parts, 80% of the city was flooded, and in some parishes, uh, over 80% of the homes were lost. Hundreds of people drowned. I've seen a lot of dead bodies, and I saved a few people, you know, out the houses, and I could have, which I could have drowned myself, you know. Tens of thousands were stranded. Despite the evacuation orders, up to 120,000 residents remained in the city. Many people didn't leave because they could not leave. They were either elderly or disabled. They didn't have cash in the bank or they didn't have credit cards. And in some instances, no family or friends outside of the city. They are getting sick out there. The water's getting pretty stagnant. There was also concerns in a lot of people that they wanted them to evacuate because they wanted their land. New Orleans was a booming city, and there were developers who wanted some of their homes and that they would be not allowed back. I can be safe in here. I can watch my house. I don't want to leave. If locals' faith in the system was frayed before Katrina, the failure of authorities in its aftermath tore it apart. This is a devastating storm. This is a storm that's going to require immediate action now. I'm pleased to report the troops that have been called in that the convention center is secure. By September 1st, 30,000 people had crammed into the damaged Louisiana Superdome. Another 25,000 in the convention center both designated temporary shelters. Despite their official status, they had nowhere near the resources to cope with this scale of disaster. Conditions were diabolical. So there's six bodies upstairs on the third floor, and then there's this guy right here that's dead. And they've been making promises to us that they were gonna 
Move us, move us, and move us. And people just really been getting frustrated at this point. The media reported widespread looting, and the authorities appeared more interested in incarceration than belief. We ain't got nothing. You know, we got to steal from each other so we can survive and feed our children. There were reports of isolated cases of violence among the abandoned population in the evacuation centers. As the evacuees were becoming increasingly desperate, There were massive food and water shortages in the Superdome as well as in the convention center. We have regular insulin! And so you can imagine when there are tens of thousands of people in these conditions, how quickly you might think things would descend into chaos, and that was what the media really reported. Instead, it appears that people really began to self-organize to figure out how they could get the resources there that were necessary, especially for the most vulnerable people. I thank God that everybody is sticking as neighbors and helping one another. If we didn't have one another in this city, we would be lost. Thank you. Eventually, thousands of people sheltered in New Orleans were evacuated out of the city. Keep your family members together! Thousands of federal troops were sent in with ships. I'm in National Guard, do you need help? And hundreds of helicopters. But it wasn't enough. A plea was broadcast across local TV and radio for private boat owners to come to the rescue. They became known as the Cajun Navy. Hurricanes, I really believe, bring out the best in people. Humans have a desire to stick together when the chips are down, and I think that a hurricane or an earthquake or something like that brings it out. We've studied this. There's actually a, a whole feeling of, of community cohesion, a kind of euphoric feeling that we can do this together. Knowing your neighbor, being connected to your neighbors, and really helping one another to prepare for these extreme events may be one of the most important things that individuals can do in terms of increasing their own probability of survival in a disaster. The Atlantic provides conditions for some tremendously large hurricanes. The Atlantic Basin often gets very, very wide diameter systems. They're really dangerous because the strong winds extend out for such a long distance. Hurricane tracks from the last 150 years look like mad scribbles drawn inexorably to the same location. Why does the southeast coast of the US act like such a magnet? As with all weather patterns on Earth, if you follow them back to their ultimate source, you end up at the sun. As it beats down on the Sahara, the enormous desert that spans North Africa, heat radiates back off the landscape. As heated air rises several kilometers into the atmosphere, it turns and moves toward the Gulf of Guinea. This movement of air becomes the African easterly jet, a band of wind that moves across the Atlantic, heading straight to America. This jet gets kinks in it, carrying low-pressure systems known as tropical waves. Tropical waves take on many forms, but they're sort of organizations of thunderstorms that travel across the tropics. 
And this is how Katrina began. The tracks of most Atlantic hurricanes usually head back out to sea. But it was very scary, very scary. Oh my God. But the path of Superstorm Sandy, one of the most destructive and surprising hurricanes to hit the east coast of America, left many forecasters scratching their heads. Sandy formed late in the 2012 hurricane season, beginning fairly predictably in the Caribbean. Las condiciones que tenemos aquí en la vivienda, ustedes pueden apreciar. No sé si podrá soportar el impacto del ciclón. Sandy did form from tropical wave. It became a, a major hurricane as it crossed over Cuba and moved toward the Bahamas. As a category three, Sandy tore across Cuba. Waves up to nine meters smashed the Cuban coast, along with a two-meter storm surge. More than 100,000 homes were damaged. And 11 people killed. And Sandy just kept going. You know, after it had intensified and gone through Cuba, we expected it to go out to sea. Due to a phenomenon known as the Coriolis effect, cyclones will spin in different directions depending on their location in relation to the equator. If the cyclone occurs in the northern hemisphere, they spin anti-clockwise, while the opposite occurs in the southern. This has a dramatic effect on a cyclone's path. So in the southern hemisphere, they tend to curve out towards the southeast. In the northern hemisphere, they tend to curve out towards the northeast. And so in the case of the east coast of the US, it would be moving away from the coast. But for some reason, Sandy bucked this trend. It really got strange, but it made the left turn, which is very unusual for, for a hurricane in the Atlantic. Sandy kept growing in size. It started developing cold fronts and, and warm fronts. So it became a structure that was quite unfamiliar to most hurricane forecasters. It then went through what we call extra tropical transition. So in other words, it's moving into cooler waters. So it technically wasn't a hurricane anymore because it was a beast, basically. As it passed over cooler waters, Sandy lost intensity but grew in size, becoming the largest Atlantic hurricane in recorded history. At its widest, Sandy had a diameter of 1,400 kilometers. The beast's left curve into the most densely populated area of the US was the result of Sandy's collision with another weather system. It turns out that there was a particularly strong system to the west of Sandy. Cold air actually coming quite far south over the central and eastern United States that played a role in Sandy's turn to the left. The merging systems brought snow and ice to the mountains of West Virginia, with blizzards slamming into the region in a howling gale. Crazy. You can't go nowhere. Trees in the road, the interstate shut down. Not much you can do. Feet of snow in, in parts of the uh, Appalachians. Just amazing. So you had these uh, this juxtaposition of tropical hazards and wintertime hazards in such an event. As the Appalachians froze, the northeast coast was smashed by huge storm surges exacerbated by the full moon and high tide, two days before Halloween. It hit us really, really bad. So places around New York City and along the New Jersey coast were completely inundated. 
big disruption, a lot of problems in a heavily populated area. There was more than a 10-foot storm surge at the battery. It was higher than any structure they had to prevent it, and so once the water got over that, it had nothing to keep it from going into the subway and, and other things. And so there were widespread power outages throughout lower Manhattan, as well as uh, in surrounding regions that millions of people had their power knocked out. We also saw schools that were badly flooded. In Superstorm Sandy, people had to be evacuated because of flooding that was occurring there. Hurricane Katrina had taught the U.S. health system many lessons about preparedness. So even though damage and flooding were widespread, health services did not collapse. Probably one of the biggest lessons we had from Hurricane Katrina was how the health system was not prepared. We realized that the healthcare system needed to take responsibility for itself and have its own emergency management approach. As a result, in Hurricane Sandy, the New York City area hospitals really did quite well in many regards. Though there were closures, they had been practicing and they had been preparing during that decade in between, and hospitals were up and running very quickly. Finding boats in the middle of the road is not what anybody would hope for today. The full moon and high tide enhanced the storm surge, along with climate change. Though we knew with high tide it was going to be really bad, we just never thought it would be this bad. Sea levels surrounding New York are around a foot higher than they were in 1950. This makes any storm surge more severe than it would have been a century ago. The total cost was somewhere around $75 billion, and probably half of that uh, is associated with the flooding of the subway system. And so the damage was tremendous. Climate change is also warming the seas, which fuel hurricanes. The best way to think of it, in my view, is that the storms mostly occur much as they did before. But it's in a warmer, moister environment, as a result, it can actually reach out and grab more moisture and bring it into that storm. It can invigorate the storm in that process. The strongest effects are in the tropics, so this relates to hurricanes in particular. This had a dramatic effect on the deadliest Atlantic hurricane in the last 200 years with a death toll over 11,000. It was the rainfall that turned Hurricane Mitch into an unrivaled human disaster. Bueno, yo estoy para volverme loca, sinceramente no. Mi vida es andar para arriba y para abajo porque mientras no encuentre el resto de mi hijo para enterrarlo tan siquiera. Hurricane Mitch began in the Caribbean in late October, 1998, and rapidly intensified, reaching Category 5 status in just two days. As it approached Honduras, winds had weakened considerably, but the storm became extremely slow-moving, producing a tremendous amount of rain in one region. The hilly terrain was subject to all this incredible moisture uh, moving in from the Atlantic and riding up on the hillside, creating devastating flash flooding. This happens in other parts of the world too, where you have such a tremendous amount of moisture coming inland, encountering mountains or hilly terrain where there's just so much water coming down at once that mudslides occur and these can take out entire towns. In Honduras, entire villages were washed away by mudslides. It 
it's all rain induced and you, you can it's easy to get 10 to 20 inches of rain on hillsides in a relatively short period the soil underneath just can't withstand that and, and eventually it just gives way and becomes liquid and it all slides down the hill that's what killed most of the people hemos dedicado lo que es la búsqueda y recuperación de cadáveres entonces nuestra labor ahorita es ver lo que podemos recuperar de los cadáveres y The storm's effects reached Nicaragua. One gigantic mudslide in Pasoltega killed 2,000 people. Rescue workers who tried to reach devastated villages were severely hampered by rising floodwaters. In Honduras, most of the land used for agriculture is on hillsides. With many years of slash and burn agriculture, farmers cut and torched forests to plant crops, clearing new areas again when soils became less fertile. In cases where there has been a fire or deliberate logging and deforestation, you disturb the soil's ability to deal with the amount of water that's coming down directly as precipitation or runoff. Once we start chopping down trees, in any environmental situation, we're going to cause damage, but also the stability of the land surface as well. Mudslides demolished many of the country's crops. Bananas, beans and sugarcane were hard hit with losses totaling $480 million. Roads were cut off and bridges destroyed, leaving those desperately in need of assistance isolated. Much of the infrastructure was devastated. In both countries, a total of 2 million people were left homeless. No ha dado nada, ni, ni comida, ni, ni ayuda en material. The months that followed became a life and death struggle for some of Latin America's poorest people, who had only recently started to recover from years of civil war. The impact was so devastating that the World Meteorological Organization permanently retired the name Mitch from its hurricane list. In the years preceding Mitch, tropical cyclones have become more severe, and the retiring of names has become more common. The 2005 hurricane season was so severe, it saw a record number of names retired. Dennis, Rita, Stan, Wilma, and Katrina. But for many New Orleans natives, the scars Katrina left will never fade. You have the original trauma of the hurricane, which is extremely upsetting. You're seeing your house flooding. You might be seeing dead bodies floating by. This will go on for hours, if not a day or more, before you get help. Very traumatic experience. As families are moved into temporary shelters in the aftermath, the stress is ongoing. As a sociologist, I was particularly interested in studying how children were affected by the storm and its aftermath. Almost all of the children miss days, if not weeks, if not months of school. There were also impacts in terms of the shattering of friend and family networks. We also saw many longer term effects for children in terms of who graduated. Had a lot to do with 
how many times they moved after this storm. It's often said that natural disasters are the great equalizer, but the opposite is closer to the truth. One of many insights that has come out of this work is that disasters don't dissolve pre-existing inequalities. What disasters do is they exacerbate social fault lines. When it comes to who has the resources, the capacity to actually prepare for, respond to, and recover from disaster, we know that that is profoundly influenced by social class, by race, and by other characteristics. Some of the populations that were displaced in Katrina included some of the most economically disenfranchised populations and also were some of the areas of the city that were slowest to get the necessary recovery resources. Almost six weeks after Katrina first made landfall, the last of the water was pumped out of New Orleans. But returning home is by no means an end to the trauma. And even after a storm passes, the water stays in a building and continues to wreak havoc. And in many cases, homes were had to be destroyed completely. just had these large expanses that were uninhabitable for a very long time. And even after the water drains away, you still have to deal with the cleanup and the economic cost is enormous. The effects linger for years and even decades after such a devastating event. The first reaction was I was glad I got out myself. You know, glad I didn't stay because I certainly wouldn't have made it. Many important lessons have been learned from the mistakes of Hurricane Katrina. However, there's no guarantee it won't happen again, even in the same city. And one of the unfortunate things is the Corps of Engineers has built back most of these levees to prepare for the next Category 3 storm, but they're not prepared for a Category 4 or Category 5 storm. And so this can easily happen again sometime in the future. As destructive as tropical cyclones are, viewed as purely a meteorological phenomenon, they are an awe-inspiring and extremely important part of the natural balance of our world. They are a, an amazing force of nature. Their symmetry, um, the way they move, the way they form is quite phenomenal. But they're also a mechanism which redistributes heat very effectively around the Earth. We need that to be able to perform that meteorological mechanism. Continuing our scientific fascination with tropical cyclones is essential for better predicting where and when the next big one will hit. They're extremely complicated to understand, and really understand. And to understand how they form, you need to really understand the entirety of atmospheric sciences, all the way from how water vapor behaves to complex dynamics in, in the atmosphere. And you have to put it all together. It still never ceases to amaze me that this unbelievable machine, this scary creation, it's just a, a natural result of the Earth's processes. We know what we need to do in order to help populations to better prepare for disasters. Come on, boy. Right now, it's a question of do we have the political will and are we going to invest what it's actually going to take to help make communities and cities more resilient to natural hazards.
Of all natural disasters, floods are the most common and the most deadly. When their bodies were found, many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left. They have the power to bury cities, decimate farmlands, and ruin economies. These extreme rainfall events are known to produce some of the highest impact uh, types of weather phenomena that we see around the world. Floods are inevitable, but their catastrophic effects depend largely on human behavior. When you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood. We see these events all over the world where the weather event plus the vulnerability can truly lead to a major disaster. But my entire life for it is washed away. How we build, where we live, how we power our lives. These floods had a one in a thousand year chance of, of occurring. But with climate change, it increases the odds. And this much bigger flood wave then comes and hits a much denser population. What can we learn from the big floods of our time? And how can we best prepare for an uncertain future? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? Pakistan is a landscape of extremes. It sits on the edge of the world's warmest ocean, the Indian Ocean, and backs up against the icy peaks of the Himalayas. It has this mountainous region that is very steep, but then after that, it's, it's relatively flat. It has this mountainous region, very fertile lands. From the glaciers to the sea runs the mighty Indus. The Indus River is one of the biggest rivers in the world. It has a massive floodplain. And this is essentially the reason why that part of the world is so fertile and so productive in terms of agriculture. The Indus Valley is one of the early cradles of civilization. Around 6,000 years ago, people here began farming the landscape and building urban centers. Now, more than 100 million people in Pakistan rely on the river for drinking water and irrigation. The Indus gets some of its waters from snow and glacial melt, but most from the enormous amount of water dumped each year by the Asian monsoon. हम खुदा का शुक्र करते हैं कि बहुत अरसे के बाद कराची में बड़े इंतजार के बाद बड़ी गर्मी के बाद बारिश हो रही है इट्स पीपल आर नो स्ट्रेंजर टू फ्लडिंग इन फैक्ट इट्स की टू देयर सर्वाइवल फ्लड इज एसेंशियली द इनंडेशन ऑफ वाटर ऑन अ लैंड दैट नॉर्मली इज नॉट कवर्ड बाय वाटर this inundation can be massive. It can be really inundated for kilometers and kilometers and kilometers. It can be a minor inundation. These minor inundations are the frequent floods that civilization has depended on to sustain our ecosystems or provide nutrients or spread silt on floodplains. This is where the biggest, you know, agricultural farms in the world have existed. The Asian monsoon can vary dramatically in its intensity, 
as it's driven by heat. Every summer, the monsoon starts about uh, June, and it runs through August or September every year, and it brings most of the rainfall to the region. It's primarily forced by a difference in the land and sea temperature. In the summer, the land heats up much faster than the ocean, and this drives a lot of the oceanic moisture into the continent that is then focused by the Himalayas. And it creates copious amounts of rainfall throughout the country. And this is the majority of the water that falls on the continent. Every three years on average, Pakistan experiences a major flood. But 2010 was their most destructive in history. The monsoon is a life-giving, you know, source of water for a lot of South Asia. But that one was extraordinary in that there was an exceptionally long duration of heavy rain. There's also been a tendency in recent decades for the monsoon front to be a little bit further north, which is causing rain to occur in parts of the country that have more steep terrain. Heavy monsoonal rain had already been falling through most of July, with floods creating havoc in Balochistan. But in the last week, a torrential downpour began to pound the northwest province of Khyber Pathankhwa, a mountainous part of the country that normally remains arid and dry, even in monsoon season. It was basically very weak uh, precipitation that was formed by the uplift of moist air along the topography, which is very rare, actually, for this part of the world. Some parts of the province reported almost four meters of rain in a week. The steep terrain concentrated the intense rain into pockets of the landscape, creating flash floods. Basically, you get more rainfall into the, some of these river valleys that then collects and then floods the lowlands. And in this Pakistan case, actually, it, it flooded Peshawar, which is a river valley uh, kind of in, in the lowlands, but the precipitation was concentrated over the complex terrain. Think of a flood as a spectrum. On the very short fused end of the spectrum, it rains, and even before the rain stops, within hours, you could have a very devastating flood moving through. That's a flash flood. In Pakistan, you had, in the initial stages with these big bursts of rain, you had flash flooding, especially in the steep areas where the water's gonna flow faster. But then eventually that reached the big rivers, which swelled up and it took days, you know, for them to reach their peak as well. So they saw the whole spectrum. Some tributaries of the Indus almost doubled their previous record flow rates. many rivers reach record levels. But even the smaller creeks, as you go up into the highlands, in some cases, they were the first to burst their banks, cause flash floods, and that ended up downstream in the bigger rivers. Locals described the rivers as demons, consuming all in their path. Although floodwaters subsided within days in the northern parts of Pakistan, more than a thousand were killed in these early flash floods. Floodwaters are, are one of the world's worst natural hazards in terms of loss of life and economic damage, and people quite often underestimate the power of water. As soon as water starts to move, it can be highly destructive. Each cubic metre weighs a tonne. It can rip up 
boulders weighing tons, if it hits a building or a car or a person, then it just has an enormous force behind it. For many Venezuelans, the power of water is something they will never forget. In 1999, a devastating debris flow hit the state of Vargas, a narrow strip of coastline to the north of the country. The December 1999 floods in the north coast of Venezuela were exceptional because it was one of the deadliest recorded floods in history. In fact, I'm told in Vargas state, 10% of the population lost their lives. In that event, tens of thousands were buried alive under torrents of mud and rocks, even as they slept. There's a dreadful irony to the Vargas tragedy. Its history of catastrophic flooding is the reason so many people settled here in the first place. If you're not familiar with the north coast of Venezuela, it's very steep mountains that come down to the Caribbean Sea. Historically, there have been many flash floods there that deposit a lot of sediment and debris, and they create these flat, fan-shaped areas called alluvial fans. Alluvial fans are typically found where a canyon drains out from the base of mountains. They form when heavy rains lift the topsoil and rocks off steep slopes and carry them towards the ocean. These fans can be enormous. Entire cities have been built on alluvial fans. Because these are flat, these are natural places for cities to build. So the population tends to be located on these alluvial fans. But these alluvial fans are still building. One of these is the Carabaeda fan. The city of Carabaeda was founded several years after the last major flood event in 1951. By 1999, the population had swelled to more than 300,000. In Vargas State, and in particular in the city of Carabaleta, we combine two things that we see so often in floods. There's the intense rain, and then there was the vulnerability. You had a major flood event, something that there's evidence has happened before, and you have now, what you didn't have centuries ago, a large population on the areas where the debris is being deposited. December is not normally rainy in Venezuela. The wet season usually wraps up around October, but a cold front had interacted with a moist southwesterly wind in the Pacific Ocean, and heavy rains began to fall in the San Julian Basin, which feeds the Carabaeda fan. There was a period of abnormally high rainfall so that the ground is wet, rivers are already running high, and then on the night of December 15th into 16th was the really intense rain. Eyewitness accounts say debris flows began around 8 p.m. on the 15th, when a phenomenal amount of water cascaded down the mountainside, ripping apart the landscape and triggering thousands of shallow landslides. There's a huge amount of water moving down a very steep slope. Once water's picked up a lot of debris and it's got boulders in it, then, then all sorts of structures will be vulnerable. And all of this started coming down and finally it hit this flat patch of land. That is where all the people were living and it caused massive devastation. The amount of water that came down the steep slopes in three days was almost double the yearly average rainfall. The United States Geological Society estimates around 1.8 million cubic meters were dumped on the city. The city was destroyed. Boulders the size of trucks 
were lifted off the mountainside and hurled into apartment buildings. Bueno, esto fue algo inesperado. Pero esta vez fue algo, como se dice, como si se hubiera abierto el Cerro Ávila. Debris deposits were head high. No exact death toll was recorded because entire towns, including Cerro Grande, simply vanished. Only a thousand bodies were recovered, but it's thought up to 30,000 people may have perished, either buried or swept out to sea. Survival of those kinds of floods where you have a lot of debris in the water and it's high velocity water is very difficult. There was a study done in, in the United States in the state of Colorado where 144 people died in a flash flood in 1976. And the coroner had determined that none of them drowned. They all died from traumatic injuries. Many of them didn't even have body hair or clothing left when their bodies were found. That's the force of what happens in these steep mountain areas when you have all this debris coming down with the water. This is an example of ferocity of a flash flood. A flood that is coming down a big river, a long river like the Indus or the Ganges or any of the long rivers, uh, it's kind of predictable. With such steep mountains, the prediction time is nothing. In the aftermath, 64,000 troops were deployed to Vargas, along with massive bulldozers to clear an access path to the towns. The major highways were buried, making evacuations difficult. For those survivors who stayed, there were little supplies for months. A notoriously volatile part of the world, looting was widespread amidst reports of rapes and other violence. Vigilantes patrolled the streets with sticks and baseball bats. The cost was put at close to 3.5 billion US dollars. But despite the inherent risks of living on the Carabayeda fan, the city began to rebuild once more. Ahorita está todo destruido por todos lados y mientras que uno consigue eso será dentro de un año, dos años que arreglen esto, que uno se puede ir mientras tanto hay que seguir volviendo aquí porque para dónde se va a ir uno, para dónde. While severe floods have occurred on these alluvial fans since prehistoric times. The Vargas death toll may have been much lower had the steep terrain above not been deforested. The rain that comes down, about 10% of that will get stuck onto the leaves of the tree. That's called interception. So basically you're having roughly 10% more rain coming down instantly onto the ground. Forests help stabilize an area. So when you remove forests, the, the soil is much more prone when it's on a steep slope to just slide away with the flood. So this whole process of the rain flowing to the river becomes much faster. Deforestation has also stripped Pakistan bare in recent decades. When it became independent in 1947, around a third of the country was covered in forest. Now, that figure is less than 2%. Some of the tree loss is due to poverty, with trees providing fuel and other resources. But most is attributed to the Timber Mafia, an illegal and ruthless logging organization which has operated under the protection of the Taliban. In the flash floods, logs from felled trees caused devastation of their own. Swept out of the valleys into raging rivers, 
They helped smash down every bridge in their path. More than 250 bridges collapsed in Khyber Pachankwa alone. So you have damages and transportation routes, not at just one bridge, but across the entire segment of the river. Flash floods took out power stations, telecommunication towers, homes, crops, and other infrastructure, creating a rolling disaster. The rolling disaster is essentially a disaster happening that is triggering off another disaster that is triggering off another disaster. We have a major flood event. The services that sustain society, they are the first things to get disrupted. Transportation routes are impacted. People are unable often to communicate. All the stormwater services, all the sanitation services are not working. So it's, it's like one problem after another. By early August, floodwaters had begun to subside in the north and create devastation in the south. Punjab and Sindh were inundated as the Indus broke its banks in many places. The rains simply wouldn't stop. Deforestation helped silt up many waterways and dams, reducing their flow capacity. Ironically, so did levees, canals, and other structures built to tame the river. The entire Indus Valley area is probably one of the most efficient um, irrigation networks in the world. But when you create canals, you don't really allow for the frequent floods to occur. These minor floods should take the silt from the river and wash it out onto the floodplains. But as more canals and irrigation systems crisscross the landscape, less silt is escaping the river system. So the amount of space you have between the bottom of the canal or the river and the land starts reducing. So the river levels start rising up over the course of time. Now when you have this big major flood coming along, this major flood impacts much more than what it would have had the river bottom been a little bit lower. From degradation of the environment to failed engineering projects, a raft of human activities enhanced the 2010 floods. But of them all, the long-term burning of fossil fuels attracted the biggest portion of the blame. The intensity, northerly position, and persistence of the rainfall were all linked to anthropogenic climate change. 2010 was quite remarkable in many places around the world. The sea surface temperatures were very unusual throughout the tropics. The overheated Atlantic waters triggered a vigorous hurricane season. And this helped set up a strange circulation pattern in the atmosphere. The Northern Hemisphere jet stream began to wander. There are several components to the jet stream. The one we hear about the most, the polar jet, is a ribbon of air that flows west to east. And there are waves in a jet stream. Then along those waves, that's where storm systems occur. The westerly winds push these systems across the globe. Sometimes those waves can get really amplified, so they're very north-south. When that happens, the bottom of the wave, what we call the trough, can become very slow moving. So when you have a very amplified flow, you could get a storm stuck in one area, and you could get a dry spell in what we call the ridges stuck in another area. And that's exactly what happened in 2010. This buckling of the jet stream 
carried the monsoon rains further north into Pakistan than normal. At the same time, Russia sweltered under a massive, stagnant, high-pressure system. They lasted for about a couple of months, enough to really cause major trouble in Russia, where it got extraordinarily hot and dry, wildfires broke out, uh, things got uh, quite out of control, in fact. And then, not that far away, in fact, there were substantial floods over Pakistan. We found anomalous circulation patterns that brought warm, moist air from both the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal all the way up into the, into the region near uh, northwest India and Pakistan that then rose up the terrain and it eventually caused the floods that occurred throughout the month. Although the majority of deaths in Pakistan were due to the flash flooding, it was the persistence of the rain that displaced so many people. The Pakistan 2010 flood actually was more of a slow-rise flood. What happens in many of the big flood and drought events that we see around the world, but again, there's some studies showing there's a somewhat greater tendency for that to occur in recent decades. There is evidence that over the last 60 years, the jet stream is the waviest it's been for centuries, favoring more of these systems that become stuck. A leading theory is that a warming Arctic is a major contributor. So one of the things that helps drive the jet stream is the Arctic and the Antarctic are these real cold reservoirs. And what causes the jet stream is the thermal difference between the north and the south. The temperature difference between these icy regions and the tropics drives the winds that form the jet streams. The Arctic is warming faster than anywhere on Earth. And in summer, much of the Arctic is now ice-free. It's lowering the temperature difference between the tropics and the poles. So rather than this real strong west-east jet stream pattern in the northern hemisphere, the fact that the Arctic isn't as dramatically cold as it used to be is allowing more of that wavy pattern. That's as the theory goes. There's still a lot of discussion and debate about it, but there's more and more scientists studying that idea. Like a lazy river, the jet stream is wandering all over the place. And this favors all sorts of unusual and persistent weather systems. From severe drought, to unseasonal blizzards, to torrential rains that just won't go away. But there's another way global warming intensifies floods. Louisiana, on the southeast of the US, sits at the edge of the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. This is a state used to a good drenching. Southern Louisiana is a place that gets heavy rain. There's no doubt about it. But the rains that fell in 2016 were off the charts, dumping as much as seven centimeters per hour in some parts. Baton Rouge bore the brunt of it. My entire life for it just washed away. Hurts you to your heart to see him, you know, that happened to him, but that's what happened. It was a weak tropical depression. It didn't have a strong circulation attached to it, but it had tremendous amounts of rainfall. There were some measurements along the coast, along the Gulf Coast, and they recorded the largest amount of moisture in the atmosphere that had ever been recorded in that area. This is associated with quite warm conditions in the Gulf, and the moisture was coming out of the Gulf and just dumped a tremendous amount of water on the, on the ground in that region. At the same time, in the center of the US, a short wave trough was forming. This is an atmospheric disturbance that causes air to rise ahead of it. The trough drifted towards the Gulf of Mexico. Eventually, the two systems met and produced a double lift effect. 
The warm, moist air rose rapidly, then cooled before the rains came down. This is kind of what you associate with a very violent or vigorous thunderstorm uh, that you see with strong updrafts, uh, very high precipitation rates. Sometimes you have hail. Nearly 26 trillion liters of water were dumped on Louisiana in a week, three times more than during Hurricane Katrina. It was unprecedented in anyone's living memory. We actually lost everything in Katrina, came here, and 10 years later lost everything again. So I think when they started getting these tremendous amounts of rains day after day after day, the disaster was already unfolding around them before people and officials started realizing, wow, this is actually a lot worse than it first appeared it might be. But it wasn't just a once-in-a-lifetime flood. In terms of the past records, they were regarded at the time as one in a thousand year floods in some locations. But with climate change, these are not unexpected, but to many people, they are. The Amite River rose almost 1.5 meters above its previous record level. Here in the United States, many cities designed their systems with 50 or 100 years of flood record. That's not enough to tell us what the big ones are. And when you have very urbanized environments, that actually can contribute more to the flood as well, because pavement and development tend to inhibit the ability of water to soak into the ground. So cities are known to actually flood with less rain than rural areas. In the Louisiana floods, 13 people lost their lives. Most of them in cars. So in societies where cars are, are more prevalent, people are used to driving their cars and they, they feel quite safe in their cars. But really a car's just like a, a bubble of air, like a balloon. Ironically, most car deaths happen in the larger, heavier vehicles, as drivers presume them to be safe. So we ran a series of tests on a range of different cars. So a large four-wheel drive in 60 or 70 centimetres of water, the, the rear wheels will start floating. We were quite amazed at how little water it did take for, for those vehicles to become unstable. Once the water rises above the floor of the car, it will interact with a bubble of air in the cabin. For compact cars, this is not even knee height. Smaller cars will start floating in very shallow water depths of the order of 30 or 40 centimetres. Once you're floating, you go where the water goes, and usually it's water going over a road embankment or over the top of a bridge that lifts the car off and then pushes it off the embankment or off the bridge into deeper water. Roadways are completely flooded. You can't see any of the signage, uh, basically feeling your way through high water. In Louisiana, emergency services were overwhelmed with the volume of people needing rescue. So, the Cajun Navy stepped in. So the Cajun Navy is this group predominantly of boat owners who are from the U.S. Gulf Coast who, after a number of major disasters, they have actually come together, they've taken their boats, they've mobilized and they've gone out and they've actually rescued people during these flooding disasters. We had a boat, so we're trying to do whatever we can in our time of crisis and disasters. The Cajun Navy formed during Hurricane Katrina and reactivated in the Louisiana floods and Hurricane Harvey, rescuing thousands of people. 
They actually used social media and they used other data sources to identify where stranded populations are located and so forth. And so the Cajun Navy really seems to be all about people coming together to help people. Before floodwaters had even subsided, media reports began to ask whether there was a link between the extreme flooding and climate change. To address the question, a rapid attribution study was launched using the best available observational data and climate simulations. They found that rising temperatures had almost doubled the likelihood of a disaster like the Louisiana floods. Most of the heat is ending up in the oceans, and this has consequences. It means the air above the oceans is warmer and the air is moister, and this then affects all storms. It affects storms because heat energy allows water molecules to break free of the surface tension and become water vapor or evaporate. The warmer it gets, the more water vapor can be transported. Let's say you're not putting any more water down on the surface, but you're just redistributing how it occurs. There could be areas that have long dry spells. And then where it does rain, because the oceans are warmer, they're pumping a little bit more moisture into the atmosphere, and it can rain much more intensely than it had before. The scientific community has established that there is typically a 7% increase in the extreme rainfall that can occur with each degree rise in warming. This has resulted in extreme rainfalls across the world increasing. Coupled to this, the fact that we have more people in the world, these populations essentially are congregating more and more towards the cities. The cities lie near the rivers where the water lies. You have more people, more infrastructure assets being exposed to any flood damage, and these floods are more intense because you're having this much more rainfall coming down. Heated waters also provide the driving force for cyclones, which can help create severe flooding events, especially when they come in the middle of a wet season. Mozambique is an African nation on the southeast coast. It's a downstream country. Nine of Southeast Africa's major rivers, including the Zambezi, cross through Mozambique on their way to the ocean. It's one of the poorest countries in the world, and with a lack of irrigation infrastructure, most people live right on the waterways. Most settlements, wherever you are in the world, are nearby rivers and streams. A lot of farming also occurs on floodplains because of the soil that comes down the catchment and these floods is very rich and, and fertile for growing crops. So a lot of settlements are on river floodplains because of that reason as well. Whatever happens upstream, Mozambique suffers the consequences. Mozambique in the late fall of 1999 into January of 2000 had quite a bit of rain. And many of the rivers were already at or above flood stage. In fact, by the end of January, there had already been 700 deaths in Mozambique. Then on February 22nd, um, tropical cyclone Eileen hit as if, you know, they didn't need something worse. And that was just something that the country couldn't deal with. Eileen just happened to be the longest-lived cyclone on record. An extremely slow-moving system that traveled more than 11,000 kilometers. It turned an already catastrophic flood into Mozambique's worst natural disaster in a century. The channels of the rivers were already full, the soil was already moist, um, the emergency services had already been stretched. On top of that, this is a, a very, what we call a hydrologically sensitive area. Any additional rain isn't going into the ground. Parts of the country that had never been flooded were now underwater. By the beginning of March, a million people were homeless. 
Mozambique, with only one functioning helicopter, used by the president, was severely underprepared. There are thousands of people out there who really need to be rescued, and the helicopters you see behind here are totally overwhelmed. Six South African Defense Force helicopters saved thousands of stranded people. The situation is really bad. It's perhaps the worst thing I've uh, seen in my entire life. As neighboring countries mobilized their forces to deliver more helicopters, boats, aid, and finances, Mozambique's own history of conflict came back to haunt its citizens. Once the most landmine-riddled country in the world, the government had made exhaustive efforts to clear the explosives. That now we're going to have a problem. Where they are the mines that have been washed out, nobody knows. Plastic-covered mines were carried away in the floods, creating new minefields where none had previously existed. As you see, this is a PMN that is with explosives and with the metal contamination, you know. Tracker dogs and survey teams were sent on a dangerous mission to locate the mines. As problems mounted, a health emergency deepened. You have inundation of farms, animals dying, livestock essentially becoming a part of that same water that again breeds diseases. You typically have gastroenteritis, you have waterborne diseases. You even have cases of malaria. Water becomes a breeding ground for mosquitoes and malaria. The problem when you have large amounts of displaced people, they tend to be crowded into certain areas where maybe they're not getting the proper nutrition, and then that just can make the, the whole situation of spreading disease and illness a, a greater. So it's, it's like one problem after another that keeps on happening, keeps on accumulating. Because of this, you have a complete collapse of the health situation. By mid-August, Pakistan was also beginning to face a healthcare emergency. As the rains continued, a fifth of Pakistan was now underwater, an area roughly the size of Switzerland, Belgium, and Austria combined. So in Pakistan, being a densely populated country and a fifth of their land is submerged during this flood, the fact that 20 million people were displaced is not a surprise. That's not something the country's going to recover from very quickly. Of the millions affected, many were in desperate need of food, medical care, and most of all, clean water. Many became incredibly angry at what they perceived to be a lack of response by the government. Many of the bridges were broken, a lot of the dams were flooded. A lot of the lowland regions where people live uh, were completely flooded. So getting the aid to those, those populations required air support as opposed to uh, ground-level support, which brings a lot of challenges. Although 30,000 troops were sent in, aid was patchy and inadequate. Soon, the first cases of cholera began to appear. Cholera is often a fatal disease caused by eating or drinking bacterially contaminated water. Crowding exacerbates the problem as the bacteria is spread. But even more than that, when you have a flood sweep through, especially in an urban area, you have things like sewer lines that break and other toxic material that gets into the water. And so water becomes unsafe and diseases can spread that way too. So you have both the insect-borne diseases and the stuff associated with sanitation being disrupted. Okay. 
In a survey of flood survivors, it was found that the vast majority of the villages were getting their drinking water mainly from flood and rainwaters, or rivers and springs. So the key word here is vulnerability. So you could have a very major weather event, like a flood or a tornado, that either impacts a low population area where no one lives, or impacts a population that's very accustomed to these and prepared for it, and so its impacts will be small. Then you could have a severe or even a moderate weather event, like a flood, that impacts a population that has substandard housing that can collapse very quickly, that have no resources to fall back on if their farms are destroyed, or that are elderly or disabled and can't evacuate very quickly. Pakistan is, of course, an example of a country that has some vulnerable populations, and with the heavy rain they got, it was truly catastrophic. At the end of the 2010 floods, the official Pakistan death toll stood at close to 2,000 people. A figure dramatically lower than the millions left facing a devastating future. After the, the rains ended, there was still a humanitarian disaster where there were diseases and there were you know, food issues and all kinds of problems that, that came with this massive flooding event. In terms of the size of the population affected, it was six times greater than the 2010 quake in Haiti. And nine times greater than the Boxing Day tsunami of 2004. Floods destroyed many cotton crops. Electricity shortages paralyzed the textile industry. Food prices surged. Families lost their loved ones, livestock, homes, lands, dowries, and goods. For some people, life would never be the same again. The devastation caused by extreme flooding shows how fragile we all are. The predicted increase in the frequency and severity of severe weather events, coupled with an exploding population, may test the world's capacity to cope. In the face of both in combination, is there anything that can be done to better prepare ourselves? The first thing is to stop burning fossil fuels in particular and transition to a very low carbon economy. The other option is go back to engineering. Now, engineering options are expensive. They cause a lot of disruption. But given the options that exist with us, I don't see what else can be done. The Western countries that have put most of the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere have a moral and ethical responsibility to help developing countries to develop the technology and to, to build that, that resilience. Even in disadvantaged countries like Pakistan, huge change is possible where there is political will. Since the flooding in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, its government launched the Billion Tree Tsunami Project in 2014 as a challenge to global warming. It has already overshot its target of a billion new trees by restoring and planting 350,000 hectares of forest. These trees are also helping to secure river embankments, as well as heavily degraded slopes. It is the largest ever eco-project in the country, and such a source of national pride that many other provinces are considering the same. Before 2014, it was just an idea. So I think there will be major changes uh, in the future. The question is how quickly we're going to get there.
When a tornado siren sounds, you're lucky to have half an hour to take shelter. But a tornado can form and dissipate within seconds, and that's a very difficult forecasting challenge. For some, the first warning is the sight of a giant gray vortex of extreme wind twisting violently across the horizon. Oh my God. And then catastrophe. Homes reduced to rubble, cars tossed like tin toys, families torn apart. Not many things are designed to withstand 200 mile an hour wind. Scientists are still chasing answers to what causes the fastest winds on the face of the Earth. We're trying to understand why some tornadoes become very intense and become the real killer F4 and F5 tornadoes that we're most concerned about. We actually don't know some of the last processes that really make a storm form a tornado. Unraveling the tracks of killer tornadoes may help us one day understand exactly when and where the next big outbreak will strike. Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? The United States of America is a hotbed for tornadoes. More strike here than any other country on Earth. But the spring of 2011 brought devastation to numerous states in the biggest and most destructive outbreak in US history. In an extraordinary four-day stretch in April, 360 tornadoes ripped through multiple states, killing hundreds and racking up a $12 billion bill. It was the second catastrophic outbreak that month. The first began as a strong low pressure system traveled across the central plains of the US, pulling up warm, moist air from the Gulf of Mexico. As it interacted with a mass of cool, dry air blowing through from Canada, a line of supercell thunderstorms began to form, setting the scene for explosive, severe weather. A supercell thunderstorm is a very strong and persistent thunderstorm. They can last for hours. The key ingredient is that they are rotating and tilted. These tilted, rotating thunderstorms we see in the High Plains in Tornado Alley can last for hours and hours and sometimes produce multiple and violent tornadoes. You need the air to be very unstable, and that means the air wants to rise violently. There's air that's very low density at the surface, and there's air that's very high density above. The atmosphere wants to flip, wants to go up violently and change. You also need very strong winds. If cool, descending dry air passes over rising, warm, moist air, it's the perfect setup for a flip. This happens in a normal thunderstorm, which can quickly kill itself off. What will happen is that the rain will fall back down and kill off the original updraft, and you'll have a basically a life cycle of a, of a normal, what they call an air mass thunderstorm. To brew up a supercell, you need an added ingredient of strong, multi-directional winds at different altitudes. And then the real key ingredient is something that we call wind shear. So it's winds in the atmosphere that change speed with height, and they also change direction with height. Basically what it does is it creates rotation, but this rotation is horizontal. As you know, a tornado is vertical. So what ends up happening is this horizontal rotation, these supercells have very big, strong updrafts. Basically, it gets tilted into the vertical, so then you get 
the supercell, so you get this rotating thunderstorm. And that rotation acts to uh, bring the rain to off to the side of the updraft and allows the supercell to exist as an entity uh, much, much longer than an ordinary air mass thunderstorm. Instead of cooling itself off, a rotating supercell just keeps on going. And those are usually the strongest thunderstorms and they're associated with the most severe weather. So winds, hail, and then tornadoes. And usually the strongest tornadoes come from these supercell thunderstorms. Large tornado crossing the highway just in front of us. And then it becomes a tricky part of how the tornado actually forms. So there's downdrafts and updrafts associated with this rotating part of the supercell. As this downdraft is coming down, it's bringing down rotation to the surface. But only a small fraction of supercells produce tornadoes, which is another forecasting challenge. On the 14th of April, the old river town of Poplar Bluff in Missouri copped a severe hailstorm. It followed a four-day deluge that drenched the region with 15 inches of rain and broke the banks of the Black River. And then came the tornadoes, one after another. These outbreaks tend to be a number of supercells that are spawning one after another after another tornado. That's why they're so destructive, because it's not like one and done. The tornado may dissipate, but then it's usually followed by another tornado. Over the next three days, more than 150 tornadoes rampaged from Oklahoma to the Carolinas in an extraordinary severe weather blitz that killed at least 38 people, becoming the most active outbreak on record. In North Carolina, 30 tornadoes caused 22 fatalities, a state record. Days later, in a terrifying start to Easter, two large supercell thunderstorms moved into St. Louis, Missouri, sparking five tornadoes. The worst, a large E-4, barreled through the terminals at Missouri's International Airport. Three planes were on the tarmac, full of passengers, who rode out the most severe turbulence imaginable while still firmly on the ground. Outside the terminal, the extreme wind tossed vehicles about, including one van that was nearly pushed off the edge of an upper-level car park. A large section of the roof was torn off. Many of the glass doors and panes shattered. While many travel plans were shredded by the event, the biggest miracle of the Good Friday tornado was that no one was seriously hurt. A few days later, the super outbreak began to brew. A gigantic long wave trough came in from the west, sending alarm bells ringing throughout the central plains. Weather forecasts look set for hell to unleash across multiple states. The Storm Prediction Center issued a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch for Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, Oklahoma, and Louisiana part of the famed Tornado Alley. The United States is really a great place for tornadoes because a lot of the key ingredients come together. And in particular, they come together a lot of times in the early spring in, in the central part of the United States, what's commonly known as Tornado Alley. Much of the landscape is flat plains, as far as the eye can see. Lying between two mountain ranges, the Rockies and the Appalachian. It is just a hot spot where there's typically a lot of instability. There's a lot of wind shear, and it just is a prime area for very, very severe thunderstorms. Because we have the Gulf of Mexico, which has an enormous amount of warm, moist air that comes out from the south into the plains, but also the Rocky Mountains, which helps produce very cool, dry air that comes in aloft. 
sets itself up for overturning. And that overturning, when the warm, moist air goes violently upwards, that's how you form a thunderstorm. But uniquely in North America, there's an overlap between where that warm, moist air is flowing north from the Gulf of Mexico and waves that are still left over from late winter and early spring in the jet stream. Jet streams are ribbons of wind that circle the globe at high altitudes. As they surge over the Rockies heading east, waves in the wind belt help deliver a good dose of spin and speed to the cool, dry air. This provides the wind shear and rotation needed for supercell thunderstorms. If those ingredients all occur, then the Storm Prediction Center, which does forecast for tornadoes, will issue sort of an outlook that says this area looks prime for tornadoes. On the evening of the 25th, the first tornado to cause multiple deaths hit Valonia in Faulkner County, Arkansas. It was an EF2 wedge tornado. Wedge tornadoes get their name because they're so fat and wide, they sometimes look like a block of black clouds jammed into the ground. And they always say it sounds like a train. It didn't, it just was a you know, loud wind, our ears popped, and then just in the seconds it was over. Valonia is little more than a street in the center of farmland. The storm churned through the center of it, flattening mobile homes, flipping trailers, and downing trees. We need boots on the ground. We need, we need people here with hands on, moving stuff, piling stuff. Four people were killed, a toll which could have been much worse had the town not received a 30-minute warning. I think we're pretty good at trying to forecast supercells or tornadic thunderstorms. The difficulty is if that thunderstorm will produce a tornado and when will it produce a tornado. If you ask me what's that fraction, about 20 to 25 percent of all rotating thunderstorms produce tornadoes. There is no long-range forecasting of tornadoes, only the conditions that make them likely to happen. The average lead time during the April outbreaks was about 25 minutes. But then we have what we call the Storm Prediction Center. The SPC is looking at the weather everywhere, basically really only looking at the severe weather threat. So we're taking observations all the time in our atmosphere, and these are being fed into computer models. So we're watching these systems come across, looking for key ingredients that make up supercells, because supercells are what's going to make the strongest tornadoes. Aspects of tornado formation remain a mystery, and the science of forecasting is relatively young. But a tornado can form and dissipate within seconds, within minutes, and, and that's a, just a very difficult forecasting challenge. Because they are so short-lived and unpredictable, getting clear images has historically been part of the problem. The 1957 Dallas tornado was a turning point in tornado research. As it churned a deadly 25 kilometer path through a metropolitan area, it was clearly visible for around 40 minutes. It became one of the best documented tornadoes. More than 100 people caught it on film. From these clips and other photographs, scientists were able to estimate wind velocities and the speed of the tornado. Engineers were also able to relate those speeds to damages on the ground. In that storm, 500 were made homeless, 200 injured, and 10 people perished. Most of the reports of tornadoes came from unscientific observation. They'd go out and interview the farmer, what happened here? And the farmer would say something like, well, we lost the roof in this house, and then for some reason here, my chicken was completely plucked after the uh, tornado went through. And then have to figure out, well, you know, what is, uh, what is the wind that it would take to pluck a chicken? Those kind of things, right? By the early 60s, the interstate highway system had been completed in the U.S., and so it became possible to navigate your way to, to a thunderstorm and start making scientific observations. 
One of the researchers there, a guy named Neil Ward, was the first person to, to get the idea to get in his car and chase after a thunderstorm. What he found is the, that there is a very characteristic set of events in these thunderstorms that precede the tornado formation. For example, they find that there is a cloud base, and before the tornado forms, there's a lowering of the cloud base called a wall cloud. Then there's a rain shaft that is basically on the backside of the wall cloud. So there were just a number of uh, scientific observations. The study of tornadoes took a huge leap in the 70s when a team of scientists first managed to intercept a tornado with an experimental Doppler radar. On May 24th, 1973, conditions in Oklahoma were lining up for tornado formation and an array of instruments and cameras were set up in the field, ready for the chance. There was a severe tornado a case, and, and it actually led to the development or formation of the National Severe Storms Lab. They chose a good location. Right on cue, an F4 tornado ripped through the farming town of Union City. And for the first time, scientists were able to capture its entire life cycle with radar from start to finish. It changed tornado forecasting forever. The National Severe Storms Laboratory is a national laboratory funded by NOAA, uh, which also funds the National Weather Service, the Storm Prediction Center, the Hurricane Center, all these groups that are associated with forecasting weather. But the Severe Storms Laboratory focuses on research, which can be very quickly applied to making better forecasts of tornadoes and other severe storms, including hailstorms and flash floods and other phenomena. Doppler radar scans of the Union City tornado led to two critical discoveries. That rotating thunderstorms could lead to tornado formation and that a tornado vortex signature, a strong radar indication of circulation, often appeared about 25 minutes before the tornado. Here, they had two critical potential warning devices, which could save many lives. Just one year after the Union City tornado, the super outbreak of 1974 occurred. It remains the deadliest spate of US tornadoes on record. As the National Weather Services were still using 1950s equipment for forecasting, warnings were virtually non-existent. It was a particularly violent outbreak, carrying with it 30 EF4 and EF-5 tornadoes. 335 people were killed and 6,000 injured. It sounded like a big train whistle and we were right underneath the front of it. I've, I've never seen anything like it and I don't want to again. Although a horrendous toll, the 1974 outbreak brought critical changes that saved lives in the future. I don't know. It was just terrible. Most importantly, money for tornado intercept research increased. What can you do? We've lost everything that we've had. Secondly, they brought in the Fujita scale as a standard language for scientists to discuss and reference different strength tornadoes. There's something we use called the Enhanced Fujita Scale. Really what it is, is it's um, a damage-based scale, so looking at damage, wind speeds are inferred. Tornadoes are rated by the amount of damage they do. So if tornadoes break a few branches, they're F0 or F1. If they completely wipe houses down to their foundation, so there's nothing left but the slab, that's an F5. 
In between, there are different levels of damage from lifting off a roof, maybe that's F1, to removing a bunch of walls, that might be F2. There are a lot finer details than that, but roughly it's the level of destruction that a home or other structure experiences. If a tornado has ferocious winds, but lands in a rural area with no destruction of property, they will receive a low rating, even those that normally cause the total obliteration of well-built structures. So if a strong tornado with 400 kilometer per hour winds goes through open wind fields, it's rated F0. In some sense, that's kind of silly because we know it's much stronger than that. Even if we measure winds stronger than that with a radar, it's officially rated F0 because of the damage. We are working with the American Society of Civil Engineers to develop a standard that uses all available evidence, including damage, radar measurements, anemometers, to try to come up with the most comprehensive and most accurate measurement of tornado winds. Get in the base. Although only around 1% of tornadoes in the US are classified on the top end of the scale, an EF4 or EF5, the majority of deaths are in these two classes. Any tornado that has a greater chance of hitting an urban area is likely to be higher rated, do more damage, and kill more people. With the advent of the Doppler radar, it's become possible for researchers to measure the extreme speeds of tornado vortexes. Doppler radar uses microwave beams to sweep through storms. These microwaves can be reflected off particles such as rain, hail, and other debris. The radar uses the Doppler effect to work out which direction and how fast these particles are traveling by how they change the reflected signal. If the object is moving away from the antenna, a lower frequency signal is detected higher if the object is moving towards the antenna. A computer translates the information into a visual representation, where different frequencies are viewed as different colors, representing speed and direction. I lead the Center for Severe Weather Research, which operates the Doppler on Wheels mobile radar fleet and also other instruments that we drop in front of tornadoes, hurricanes, other kinds of interesting weather. We've compressed everything and made it rugged and mobile so we can chase to the weather. We can go to tornadoes instead of waiting for them to come to us. By getting up close, we can see the, the fingerprints, the small details that you just can't see from farther away. We're trying to understand the map of the winds inside tornadoes. Where are the strongest winds? How are they doing damage? We're trying to watch the birth process of tornadoes and understand why some thunderstorms produce tornadoes and some don't. We're trying to understand why some tornadoes become very intense and become the real killer F4 and F5 tornadoes that we're most concerned about. Using radar, wind speeds of incredibly destructive strengths can be measured. We try to get really close, and what we could do is we can map out the two and three dimensional structure with the radar. And the closer you get, the lower down you can look inside the tornado, and the closer you get to the surface, those are the winds that are actually really impacting buildings and structures and people. Perhaps the strongest winds produced on the face of the Earth is associated with tornadoes. Recent studies using mobile Doppler radars have documented unambiguous winds of around 135 to 140 meters per second, almost 300 miles an hour winds. It's an amazing number. The fascinating thing is the tornado, how can it produce such a strong wind locally compacted at the base of the funnel of a tornado? There's a very good radar network across the US now. You can uh, see, actually see uh, rotation in, in the storm, which is also an indicator of tornado genesis. Rotation in a storm can be seen as a characteristic hook. The tornado itself as a coupling of green and red intense bands. Doppler radar can also help forecasters identify tornado signatures, like debris balls, 
which are areas of high reflectivity, where debris is carried aloft in the tornado. Particularly strong tornadoes can have massive debris balls, like the EF5 Bridge Creek tornado. One of the strongest tornadoes we've ever observed was in central Oklahoma, near Bridge Creek and Moore in 1999. That tornado went directly through a metropolitan area, so it had very high impact, killed almost 40 people, destroyed thousands of homes, just this one tornado. And we measured the strongest winds we've ever seen, or I think anybody has ever seen, over 300 miles an hour, almost 500 kilometers per hour. The damage in that tornado was not just F5, it was very you know, serious F5 level damage. Homes were just wiped and scoured off their foundations. Fields and lawns were, were scoured with the grass removed. It was a very dramatically strong tornado that caused bad impacts, you know, strong impacts to the areas it hit. I walked into the tree line, caught a movement out the corner of my eye under some debris around the base of a tree. I seen a, what appeared to be a baby. Oklahoma City is near the heart of Tornado Alley in the US, and Moore has had its fair share. Being struck more than 20 times by tornadoes, a number of them particularly violent and destructive. On the afternoon of May 20th, 2013, another long-lived EF5 tornado mowed through the town. Whole neighborhoods looked as though they'd been thrown in a blender so unrecognizable that street signs had to be urgently printed so that rescuers could map out where they were. In the direct path of the tornado lay two elementary schools. Parents arrived to pick up their children from school, only to discover in horror that virtually nothing was left of the buildings. Miraculously, no one died at Briarwood Elementary, but seven children perished at Plaza Towers. Neither of the schools had shelters. After the devastation, there was an outcry for change. School districts across the state called for greater funding to afford every at-risk school a tornado shelter. EF5 tornadoes are extremely rare, but the super outbreak of 2011 had three and 12 EF4s, which helps explain why such widespread destruction occurred. Most of the violent tornadoes struck on one awful day, April 27, with more than 300 deaths occurring in the space of 24 hours. Alabama bore the brunt of it. The 2011 outbreak was largely in the southeast. Uh, Tuscaloosa and Birmingham were particularly hard hit. In Tuscaloosa and Birmingham, the first wave brought nearly three dozen twisters that morning knocking out communications and power. Few expected a second round of supercells were about to whip up the most violent and long-lived tornadoes. That afternoon, an incredibly wide EF4, which spanned more than 26 football fields, churned across 130 kilometers of landscape. Wind speeds were greater than 300 kilometers an hour. 65 people were killed in that single event. The cost of simply removing the extensive debris from Tuscaloosa was estimated at $100 million. I, I'm grateful that we, we survived it, but it was one of the most horrifying experiences I think I've ever experienced in my life. Sometimes that surprises people because people say, well, that's not Tornado Alley. Tornado Alley is Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa sort of area. Uh, but actually, down in the southeast, they can get pretty severe tornadoes, too. Alabama lies in the tornado-prone 
Dixie Alley, a loosely defined southeastern region. Although it gets less tornadoes than the better known Tornado Alley, generally, they are longer lived. Dixie Alley is the deadliest region for tornadoes, but this is not based on wind speeds alone. Dixie Alley bucks the seasonal trends for tornadoes. They can even occur in winter. Many also happen at night. This leaves people less ready to respond to a warning, more likely to be taken by surprise. I knew I was in deep trouble when I saw the building coming apart across the highway here. And the next thing I knew, I was rolling. Half of the nation's mobile homes are located in the southeast. I had lived in the trailer east of you. Uh, unfortunately, I was lucky, just twisted the top off of mine. According to the Storm Prediction Center, most tornado deaths happen in mobile homes. But unfortunately, my brother wasn't so lucky. Tornado to hit it and tore it all to pieces. Which are far less structurally sound than a well-built house. Dixie Alley also has a different landscape. Much of it is covered in trees, is hilly and humid. Clouds hang lower, and tornadoes can be harder to see. Because Dixie Alley is closer to the Gulf, it also increases the likelihood of violent, rain-wrapped tornadoes. Rain wraps tornadoes is literally where there's a curtain of rain that just sort of wraps around the tornado, so it's a, it's a good descriptive term. Uh, the danger with that is it often hides the tornado visually. So if you're not fortunate enough to have a radar with you, for example, you may not even see the tornado and, and not realize it's right behind this curtain of rain. How big a tornado actually is seems to be as much a matter of opinion as it is science. Defining tornado size is problematic because everyone has their own definition. People who are out chasing look at the condensation funnel and say, that's how wide the tornado is. Worse, they're just looking at it and estimating and saying, that looks two miles wide. It's very crude, just eyewitness reports of what they think they're seeing. The Weather Service rates tornadoes by how wide a swath of damage they make. My team rates tornadoes by how big the wind circulation is, because we're making detailed maps of what the winds are. Still, some tornadoes are much, much wider than others. The widest tornado that we've ever documented, and we're in agreement with other methods of documenting width of tornadoes, was back in 2013 in central Oklahoma, near a town called El Reno. And that tornado had a width of damaging winds that we mapped that at times was four or five kilometers wide. It was extremely broad. But this was a very complex tornado. It didn't just have a single swirl of wind. Inside that were these other most violent features of the tornado that were spinning around it. Like many multi-vortex tornadoes, the El Reno Twister proved to be highly unpredictable dangerous and difficult to navigate. The tornado simply breaks down into multiple funnels all rotating around a common core. That actually happens fairly commonly with all tornadoes. Perhaps the unique aspect of the El Reno tornado is because the tornado itself was very large. These multiple funnels or suction vortices were also very large. It was one of the largest funnels ever. It was we believe an EF5 tornado, but it actually was rated EF3. There was some controversy about that. Although El Reno was only initially rated an EF3 because of the damage, individual vortices were some of the strongest ever recorded. The highest measurement of 475 kilometers an hour was the second fastest wind speed measured, just below the Bridge Creek tornado. The twister killed 20 people including a team of researchers attempting to document the tornado. One of the most famous and deadly multi-vortex tornadoes descended on the western edge of the city of Joplin, Missouri, on May 22, 2011. The Joplin tornado is well known because it went right through a medium-sized small city. 
and it turns out to be the seventh deadliest tornado in history. Why that's remarkable is the other tornadoes that were in that same ranking occurred many, many years, decades ago. So you would think with all the new technology, with all the new computers, with all the new satellite technology, how did we have an event that ranks number seven on the fatality list of tornadoes? The EF-5 touched down at 5.41 p.m. on a Sunday evening, and weather services knew in advance it was coming. Why so many people died? Turns out it wasn't because the forecast was bad, because that might be one of the first guesses. Well, the forecast must have been terrible. They had no warning. They had actually quite a bit of warning. It turns out that a large part of this was the, the social response from the people. They went back and checked, and a lot of the people that heard the alarm go off waited to hear another confirmation. Somebody calling them to confirm that you better get out of the way, or watching on TV to see maybe a TV weather forecaster to come on. That delay of waiting for a second confirmation was not good. People needed to move, and they needed to move very quickly. Joplin residents had almost half an hour to take shelter, but many didn't heed the warnings because they'd become desensitized to sirens. There's always a worry that you're crying wolf too much. Hello? That's been one of the hardest Hello? things to sort of reduce the false alarm rates. Oh, give her, sweetie. Give her, honey. Give her, sweetie. It's okay. It's not just hard science research. There's a social science aspect of how people react to warnings. And with the Joplin case, that couldn't be better illustrated. And that is what led to so many people dying. They simply didn't get out of the way when they were warned well ahead of time. It hit a substantial part of the town, so residential places, commercial places, and then also the Joplin Hospital um, was also impacted by that tornado. Views of the damage from the air give an idea of just how big and destructive the multi-vortex tornado was. Entire neighborhoods were blown away. What we say about suction vortices is that if you've looked at aerial damage photos, oftentimes you sort of see marks like this along a tornado track. So I often call them spirograph marks because that's literally what it is. And that's where the biggest or the strongest damage tends to occur. In 40 terrifying minutes, it devoured more than 7,000 homes, nearly 500 businesses, and claimed 161 lives. I had done an analysis several years before asking what if, what if a Joplin-like tornado, what if a strong tornado like we had seen in Bridge Creek or even El Reno went through St. Louis or went through Chicago or went through Atlanta? And the what if consequences were huge, you could damage 50, 100,000 different homes, potentially you could kill 1,000 people if you went through the suburbs of one of these large cities. That was very hypothetical until we had seen Joplin. If the Joplin tornado had occurred just 50 miles from its, where it went through Joplin, if it had gone through suburban St. Louis, you could have had outcomes much worse than that. And that was very sobering for those of us who were looking at these worst case kind of what if scenarios. Some scientists actually question whether the F5 was a high enough rating on the Fujita scale or whether we actually needed a higher rating on that scale was to put into context how big that, that tornado really was. And the, the Joplin tornado was especially devastating in that it destroyed approximately one third of the physical landscape. Joplin is characterized as a near-miss event because it actually occurred on a Sunday. Had the Joplin tornado occurred on a school day, school administrators there after that terrible storm acknowledged that many school children likely would have perished in the Joplin schools that were so badly devastated in that tornado event. The giant tornado caused damage to around three quarters of Joplin's buildings. The following day, Missouri Task Force One was sent in to start clearing up the damage and searching for missing persons. I hope you do find somebody. Find information, write it in a marker on their head. If they do not have a head or a proper place to write, 
ride it on their torso. I don't want to see any information on their limbs. Okay. Don't worry about desecrating somebody's loved one. You're not. You're giving us information so we can get the loved one to them. They'll clean them up before they see them. Okay. Dog teams scoured piles of rubble to try to establish where people lay buried. Everything's gone. Nothing's ever going to be the same again. Nothing's ever going to be the same again. <laughs> Even as scores of volunteers arrived to help clean up the disaster, the city remained in a state of high alert as storms gathered on the horizon once more and began to pummel the city. Although they can bring the highest wind speeds known to man, the chances of surviving a severe tornado are high if the warnings are heeded. When there is a warning, that means a tornado either is coming towards their area or might come towards their area very soon. And they should take action. They should take reasonable action to either get to an interior room of their house, or if there's a community shelter, if they're living in manufactured homes, get to one of those community shelters that's stronger. They should, as much as possible, really try to stay calm and organized. It's when people panic, people start to make poor decisions. They either try to run away or they don't pay attention and they watch it. They get mesmerized and stare at it. Or they go into a ditch where it might flood. You know, a lot of people drive towards it because they want to get a better look. The sensible thing to do is try to get away. You know, not many things are designed to withstand a you know, 200 mile an hour wind. If you have a hole on the ground to crawl into, you should do that. Quick thinking may have saved many children during a deadly tornado outbreak in Indiana, March 2012. At least 10 tornadoes touched down in Indiana. One of them, a direct hit on Henryville High. Luckily, the school had evacuated its pupils before disaster struck, but some were still on the way home in a school bus. Surveillance video from inside the bus shows what may have been in store for the students had their bus driver not raced the storm and made it back to the school and under cover three minutes before the twister struck. The empty bus was blown into a building, but no one was harmed. Of course, that isn't the place you want to be. Any vehicle is not good in a tornado. The tornado ran for a remarkable 77 kilometers and lasted almost an hour, hitting not just Henryville, but several other locations in its path. Right after it passed through, an EF-1 was hot on its heels, turning through almost exactly the same track. As if the two tornadoes weren't quite enough, baseball-sized hail also came down the largest ever recorded in Indiana, 12 centimeters in diameter. One of the most tragic stories to emerge from the disaster was the near miracle survival of little Angel Babcock. The toddler was found barely alive in a field after the tornadoes had swept through. Her entire family had been picked up by the vortex and dropped a hundred yards from their home. All were dead, except little Angel, who spent three days in critical condition before being taken off life support. Oh, they loved her. I mean, we all loved all those kids. The severe outbreak that early March also hit Kentucky, Ohio, and Alabama killing more than 40 people. Each year, seasonal outbreaks across the US bring their own set of tragedies. But even forecasters were shocked by how severe April 2011 became. The total number of tornadoes spawned that month, more than 750 represented nearly a five-fold increase on the norm. 
Why these outbreaks spawn so many tornadoes is not certain, but recent research suggests it could be part of a disturbing trend. In 2014, a Columbia University study found that the number of tornadoes and extreme outbreaks has jumped dramatically, roughly doubling over the last 50 years. Could this be due to climate change? Do we see a very distinct relationship between tornadic activity and climate change? And the answer is no. If you ask me, has there been any change in recent years about tornado activity? And the answer to that is yes. There seems to be more tornadoes than outbreaks. The number of tornadoes in an outbreak have gotten more extreme, but no one has been able to link that to, to climate change. As the world warms, the oceans are also warming, which adds to the amount of moisture and energy powering storms. Tornadoes are much trickier to deal with. Tornadoes come from superstyle storms. The climate change element is adding a little bit of extra instability. It's making the potential for a superstyle thunderstorm to be a little bit greater. Uh, whether the wind shear occurs or not is a bit of a crapshoot. I don't think that has much to do with climate change one way or the other. But when the tornado outbreaks have occurred, they tend to be a bit bigger and more damaging in recent years. While the Columbia team found no evidence of increasing instability over the US, they did find a substantial increase in storm relative helicity, the potential for rotational storms to occur due to wind conditions. Current models don't suggest this will increase in a warming climate, so the cause remains a mystery. While tornadoes are the main subject of much passionate and focused research, many aspects of their genesis remain unknown. What I find interesting about tornadoes is they're a little difficult to predict, so there's an element of surprise about them, and you don't know sometimes if tornadoes are gonna be really strong or really weak. We actually don't know some of the last processes that really make a storm form a tornado. We've made some major progress in understanding tornado structure. We've made progress in understanding some of the important processes involved with tornado genesis, the birth of tornadoes. So we know what days have enough energy for thunderstorms to form. We know which days we're gonna get waves in the jet stream. What's not so good are the details. And of course, those details are what matter to people living in the paths of the tornadoes. For those that live in the path of tornadoes, there are many questions that need to be answered to adequately know the difference between a bad storm on the horizon and imminent destruction. The details are when exactly are the tornadoes gonna form? Of those six different supercells, which one or two are gonna make the tornadoes? Of those one or two that are gonna make the tornadoes, when during their one or two hour lifespan and exactly what track will they take? Those are the details we don't know and those are the details that we're really trying to learn. I'm fascinated by tornadoes because they're so unpredictable, they're so powerful, and they really affect at least a part of the population. The questions burning in the minds of tornado researchers, who often risk their lives to answer them, have already saved countless people. In the last half century, the improvements to detection and warning systems mean typically many less people die each season, despite an exploding population. Even to those who live in the bullseye of Tornado Alley, cars, guns, and fire remain a much deadlier daily risk than a tornado. You know, the thing is, the thing why people don't lose too much sleep about it is because the probability of you being hit by this little tiny funnel uh, over this great expanse of territory is, is small.
The most catastrophic natural disasters in human history happen when earthquakes hit large populations that aren't prepared. Madame Matia, là, les gars, trois jours en deux jours, dis à la moitié, mettez le deux en bas des dalles, nous retirer sous lui. There's mysteries that we may never solve. The one we'd love to solve is predicting the earthquakes. We don't have warnings that an earthquake is going to come in terms of knowing exactly where and how big an earthquake will be. Even a relatively minor quake can threaten millions and kill hundreds of thousands when it strikes a vulnerable country. One of the things that we need to keep in mind about disasters is that the physical event is merely the trigger by unleashing vicious cycles of tragedy, building collapses, disease outbreaks, landslides, civil unrest, and urban conflict. Earthquakes change communities for generations. We can't control nature, but we can control how well prepared we are. Amid the death and devastation, each major earthquake leaves crucial lessons for survival. It often requires a tragedy to bring about change or to recognize that there is a need to change. What have we learned from living with earthquakes? And how will that help us when our world starts shaking? Around the world, humanity exists only moments from catastrophe. Disaster bubbles below the surface of the Earth, strikes from the heavens, or engulfs us from the sea. But we are not merely at the mercy of our planet. In our pursuit of industry, global connectivity, and reach for the stars, lives have been lost. Disasters reveal the best and worst of mankind as one tragedy compounds another. How do these disasters occur? And what lessons can equip us when catastrophe strikes again? Between North and South America is the Caribbean, a chain of hundreds of islands. One of the largest, Haiti, is the most mountainous Caribbean nation, with a population of more than 10 million people. One of the world's poorest countries, tropical Haiti is no stranger to natural disasters like floods and cyclones. Over the last few centuries, it's been hit by at least 15 major earthquakes. But the one that struck Haiti's capital, Port-au-Prince, on a January afternoon in 2010, has become infamous. Not so much for the size of the earthquake, but for the extreme devastation it caused. Disasters are not events, they are the end point of social processes. Haiti is unfortunately a real example of how long-term processes that impoverish people, that lead to environmental degradation, that lead to mass migration to urban centers and uncontrolled development, we see this not only in Haiti, but in so many other parts of the developing world. And these processes over time, over decades, maybe even over centuries, lead to the buildup of risk, lead to the disaster that's waiting to happen when a trigger like an earthquake comes along. But to really understand the genesis of this disaster, we need to start deep in geological time with the formation of the Earth itself. 
Like the other rocky planets in our solar system, Earth was formed over billions of years as debris, both small and massive, collided and clumped together. Each impact transferred energy in the form of heat, which is still trapped inside the innermost layers of the Earth's core, reinforced by natural radioactivity. This rigid covering on the Earth's surface is broken into a dozen or so major pieces, known as tectonic plates. It breaks into a set of plates that shuffle as the material underneath turns over to let out the heat. They move around and they jostle, they rub against each other, and they, in some cases they dive beneath each other. Stress builds up on zones of weakness, like at the plate boundaries, but also on false interior to the plates. And it takes stress accumulating for decades or centuries before the forces build up to where it cracks and breaks and moves. The cracking and breaking of the crust creates faults, of which there are three main types. A normal fault forms when force pulls the crust apart and the hanging wall drops down. A reverse fault, or thrust fault, forms when force pushes the crust together and the hanging wall moves up and transcurrent or strike-slip faults. Move the crust walls horizontally, not up or down. The rupture will then spread over the fault and can spread a thousand kilometers or more for a really large earthquake. And when it slips, it, it radiates vibrational energy out through the ground. And it turns out only 10% of the energy in the earthquake comes out as the shaking. The rest goes into cracking and heating. But that 10% of the energy that's shaking is what we notice and what, what causes all the damage. In a sense, we can trace the origin of earthquakes today back to the birth of the solar system. But all that is cold comfort to the people of Haiti who happen to live on a turbulent shunting yard of tectonic plates. Broad plate tectonics that, that drove the forces that caused the Haiti earthquake was an interaction between the Caribbean plate and the North American plate. The North American plate actually wraps around the Caribbean plate, and the Caribbean plate moves eastward relative to the North American plate. And when it impinges the North American plate to the east, it actually goes underneath the Caribbean plate. And then to the west, the North American plate and the Caribbean plate actually slide past each other. So the Haiti earthquake happened kind of in a region where both these effects were going on. Parts of the fault have been locked for centuries, accumulating stress. Without warning, they suddenly let go just before five in the afternoon on the 12th of January, 2010. The epicenter, where the tectonic stress was released, was less than 25 kilometers from Haiti's most populous city, Port-au-Prince. The impact was so devastating that the true death toll may never be known. The estimates range from 80,000 to 330,000, with most people agreeing that it was somewhere in the neighborhood of about 220,000. The earthquake was a magnitude seven, and it was deadly. What made it deadly was the fact that it was very close to a populated center. There were about 2.4 million people exposed to violent shaking from the Haiti earthquake. What turned this from a disaster into a catastrophe was the fact that those buildings in the region were very brittle and could fall in the earthquake shaking. Within the Caribbean, 
Most countries there uh, use uh, the Caribbean Uniform Building Code, but not so in Haiti. And so as a result, when they did have that earthquake, uh, you had a very vulnerable building stock, and hence you had the consequences that we saw. Many of the multi-storey buildings of Port-au-Prince became death traps when their unreinforced brick walls broke apart, piling up concrete floor slabs in what's known as a pancake collapse. The shaking causes a disintegration of the, the columns and the walls that are supporting the floors, and then you basically end up with a stack of floor slabs. And in some cases, you can have multi-storey buildings be ending up as a great big stack of floor slabs, and you can just imagine the consequences, you know, for people in that building at the time. That was my father's house. So we lose it. My mother was... Now, now, we have, we have some, somebody, somebody here. Okay. There is some person we, we, inside we, we, the we house. Can't, we, can't, we can't find him. We, we don't have a, a loader to, 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 to take them out. Beyond the immediate aftermath, earthquakes in poor or politically paralyzed countries set off a chain of rolling disasters that can take years or even decades to resolve. Haiti has long been known as the Republic of Non-Governmental Organizations, the Republic of NGOs. International donors provide funding to NGOs as opposed to funding to the government to perform governmental functions. The president is saying the airport, why well, you don't do nothing for us? We try to, to ask to help us, at least for the food and, and water. Y ahora vamos a ver qué hacemos porque no tenemos medicamentos, no tenemos material para trabajar. It's unfortunately the case that in Haiti there were many people who were barely self-sufficient before the earthquake. And the nature of the damage, the social disruption, and the damage to service delivery systems made the recovery all that harder. We're talking about a disaster where merely removing the debris took years. But it's not just poorer countries at risk of rolling disasters. Typically, the less developed a society is, probably the less prepared it can be for these major disasters. Californians need to be prepared because in their state, the Pacific Plate grinds past the North American Plate in a tectonic boundary known as the San Andreas Fault. The fault extends for 1,500 kilometers, arcing right through the richest and most populous state in the US. In 1906, the San Andreas Fault was responsible for the destruction of most of San Francisco. Over the last 200 years, California has been hit by about 80 quakes stronger than magnitude 5. San Fernando Valley is a densely populated urban area not far from downtown Los Angeles. Half past four on a Monday morning, Residents of Northridge had no idea what they were about to wake up to. For about 20 seconds, a magnitude 6.7 earthquake shook the city with the strongest ground motion ever recorded in urban North America. A minute later, there was a magnitude 6 aftershock. But this time, the San Andreas Fault was not directly responsible. Ominously, this quake came from a blind thrust fault that was previously unmapped and unknown. Prepare yourselves! Shut off the gas, shut off electricity, store water in your bathtub, don't expect services for 72 hours. 
Northridge had a blind thrust. That meant that the fault that moved uh, didn't break all the way to the surface. That also means we don't know exactly where the fault is in general until it breaks. And so people who were right above the fault had no way of knowing until the earthquake broke. It was pitch black and she wasn't crying and she was still. So we thought she was dead. We're just now starting to get our operating rooms uh, cleaned up. We st we're still unable to sterilize instruments, so we really can't perform any major surgery. 57 people were killed, some immediately, some within a few days of their injuries, and others from indirect causes, such as stress-induced heart attacks. More than 8,700 people were injured. Due to the damage caused by the earthquake, I have, by signing the document that I will sign at the end of this statement, declared these areas of California to be a major disaster. Northridge was a very interesting earthquake from a sociological point of view because it was a major earthquake striking a major U.S. metropolis that was very diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, culture, social class. And it allowed us a window into what future disasters would be like in large urban areas. Apartment blocks, office buildings, and car parks collapsed. 11 hospitals were damaged or left unusable. About 20,000 people were temporarily homeless. We also saw that it's possible for a disaster like the Northridge earthquake to create pockets where damage is so heavy that they temporarily at least become ghost towns. These kinds of effects represent real challenges in terms of recovery because it involves not individual units but entire neighborhoods that need to be recovered. Elevated freeways were smashed and bridges cut. Fortunately, the early hour on a public holiday meant the roads were not packed with traffic at the time. Property damage was estimated to be worth more than $20 billion, making it one of the costliest natural disasters in U.S. history. It's just the effect of shaking Los Angeles with a six and a half right in the middle of the city. The cost of payouts was so high that many insurance companies either stopped offering or severely restricted earthquake insurance in California. In response, a state authority was established to provide basic insurance. Here you had a very large metropolitan area with many housing units damaged, many public buildings damaged, hospitals damaged, infrastructure such as freeways damaged. So the costs go up where there are lots and lots of valuable assets. The most dangerous buildings in an earthquake are those made of unreinforced bricks or concrete blocks. We talk about better building regulations, building a, a better future, but you have the other problem of the legacy of the past. And building regulations are not retrospective. So what do you do with the high-risk elements of your community? Because of California's known seismic hazards, building codes already require new structural design to withstand earthquakes. When the damage revealed that some designs didn't actually work as intended, 
the earthquake led to a revision of the building codes. Northridge showed that efforts to mitigate seismically caused damage do work. Los Angeles had started a retrofit program for its old, dangerous buildings. Engineers who looked at buildings that were affected by the Northridge earthquake said that those retrofits really helped. Retrofits which were enacted after the San Fernando quake in 1971. Hitting at 6 a.m., a 6.6 magnitude earthquake rocked the San Fernando Valley for 12 seconds. Collapsing highways, hospitals, and homes. The quake had also caused parts of the lower San Fernando Dam to collapse, leaving only a thin dirt wall between it and the 80,000 residents below. In fear of aftershocks, the valley was evacuated as the dam level was lowered. Following this disaster, new building regulations were instituted in California. If you contrast, say, the San Fernando earthquake in 1971 to the Northridge one, the lessons from that earthquake are translated into better building regulations. Regulations that proved their worth in 1994, when the Los Angeles Reservoir, a new and improved Lower San Fernando Dam, survived unscathed. So if we think of that objective of building resilient structures, tough structures, ones that would protect life in a major earthquake, the Northridge earthquake largely illustrated the effectiveness of building regulations to do that. Can a building in an active fault zone be made earthquake resistant. There are lots of new structures built around that claim that they can be safer from earthquakes. There are great uncertainties as to our knowledge of just what the earthquake hazard is. Uh, seismologists go to great lengths to understand what has occurred in the past, the understanding of how earthquake waves propagate through the crust. So what often will protect our building through an earthquake or make it perform adequately is a toughness so that even if it's overloaded, the overall behaviour is a ductile one, it can absorb energy. Here at the Southern California Earthquake Centre, we take our science to these engineers they can build the safest buildings possible, so that it's a data-informed structure. But again, we just won't really know how it's actually going to function until after the next earthquake. It might be so badly damaged at the end that it's an economic decision to demolish it and rebuild, but nevertheless, uh, it's a safe structure. When it comes to building earthquake-resistant skyscrapers, one of the first to capture the public imagination was the 48-story Transamerica Pyramid in San Francisco. Interestingly, that building, the construction started in 1968, so it was uh, built in the context of US building regulations without the learnings of the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. It's a steel frame structure, so it's got its ductile construction. 
The mass is concentrated at lower levels by virtue of being a pyramid and so it has performed well in earthquakes that have occurred in the region and uh, we would expect it to perform very well in future earthquakes as well. The Wilshire Grand is the tallest building in California. At 73 stories, it has to withstand the swaying and even whiplash caused by the ground movement in earthquakes. It's very slender in one direction for architectural reasons. In designing that building, they tried to keep open unobstructed floor plans, so that led to a central shear core, which provides a lot of the bracing. But they also used a, a common technique for those taller structures, which we call outriggers. So at three levels, they had an outrigger system that reached out uh, to the exterior columns uh, to provide a stabilizing action as well, to stiffen the structure uh, for wind and earthquake. Like a reed in the wind, it bends in a seismic event. This building is designed to ride out the major credible event in the Los Angeles Basin, which is 8.3 on the San Andreas, coupled with the other local faults. The 101-story Taipei Tower in Taiwan is among the world's tallest. It's built a few hundred meters away from a major fault line. This is a very significant day for Taipei 101 project. It's the topping out of the, the steel structure. And with the spire in place, we will be at 508 meters, which will be the tallest uh, structure in the world. It's a country which has both severe earthquake and wind hazards, so it suffers from quite strong typhoons. So they made use of a massive uh, tuned mass damper, 660 tonne ball uh, suspended over three stories at the top of the building. If a building has a counterweight, as it shifts, it allows the building around it to move left. So that moving weight allows the building to basically flex more gently uh, from the shaking of the earthquake and then it's easier to build a strong building that will not collapse. While the tuned mass damper is reported to reduce building movement by about 40%, it's yet to be put to the test by a major earthquake. And that will have much to do with the type of soil Taipei is built on. As our buildings grow taller to help accommodate an exploding population, the very land that supports their foundations can exacerbate the effects of an earthquake. One of the common problems in earthquakes is that the cities are built in kind of low-lying flat areas near rivers and ports, and often that means the geological structure underneath is a very soft soil and wet soil. The composition of the geological layers below our cities has a dramatic effect on the way seismic waves propagate. Soft sediment increases the earthquake waves in a couple of ways. Soft sediment doesn't take so much energy to move that much, so you get much larger waves for the same amount of energy. The other way is through uh, what's called resonance. So resonance is a phenomenon like if you strike a bell, it will vibrate at certain frequencies. Just like a struck bell, the rocky layers embracing the soft sedimentary ones within a basin can amplify seismic waves. If the earthquake has happened within the basin, or beneath the basin, the earthquake energy can be reflected back into the basin. As the wave reflects, it will start bouncing around, and, and you'll get a, a system of waves that are sort of uh, being reflected back and forth, and that, that will cause the basin to resonate. And this can be a real problem if that resonant frequency matches the frequency of buildings. The problem is that when buildings resonate at the same frequency as the seismic waves, they shake themselves to bits. What devastated Port-au-Prince wasn't just rickety buildings. Because the city is built on loose soil, the shaking was amplified. 
Well, soft sediment is most like a jello on a plate. If you shake the plate a little bit, the jello shakes a lot. And so Port-au-Prince on the soft ground shook much more than the buildings on the nearby hard ground. And like the one in Northridge, the Haiti earthquake was also from a blind thrust fault that nobody knew existed. A blind thrust fault is a fault that actually doesn't reach the surface. So you can't see easily where that fault occurs. When that earthquake first occurred, we looked at the maps of fault, we looked at aerial pictures, and there's a large strike slip fault that runs through southern Haiti. And then we went in afterwards and did surveys and looked at how the ground moved by looking at displacement of corals and GPS measurements. And it became apparent that that wasn't the main culprit. There may have been some movement on that fault, but it was more likely a blind thrust fault off that main strand in Haiti that caused the shaking and caused the damage. And this is not the best news for Haiti because you can have another earthquake on that major surface fault that goes through. With Haiti's earthquake, the combination of no warning, unknown fault, amplified shaking, vulnerable population, and low quality buildings was lethal on a tragically epic scale. People were, of course, accustomed to living in very substandard conditions, even before the earthquake. But the displacement of people, the breaking of their social ties, their neighborhood ties. Just like, you know, when you sleep in the night, you got one eye open, one eye closed. You don't even sleep well. The placement of some of the emergency camps was not all that it could have been in terms of access to jobs and transportation. So there were a lot of additional stressors that people were experiencing that could lead to poor health outcomes. You have an urgent need to provide accommodation for people, and that's one of the challenges that they've had in Haiti. Now that they're rebuilding, it's very hard to enforce better building regulations because people have this urgency, and the old practices uh, do tend to come back because often they're cheaper and more understood. So you can have a, quite a challenge of building back better so that you're ending up with a more resilient community after you're there. Apart from the challenge of building houses that won't collapse, there's another problem for seismologists, finding ways to give people as much warning as possible. Fundamentally, earthquake monitoring has been the same for a long time. We have a lot of seismometers. We can tell where earthquakes happen, how big they are. We can try to understand the fault systems. One of the new elements is uh, earthquake early warning, which is a network we're building now to warn people before the shaking hits them. It turns out if you see an earthquake starting and can understand what's happening, you can tell people there's shaking that is coming but hasn't reached them yet. You can get anywhere from a few seconds to at very best a few minutes of warning to people and then they can do what you can do in a few seconds or minutes, which we think that should cut the costs and casualties by tens of percent, maybe a factor of two, if we can take the right actions. We can't predict exactly how big and where an earthquake will be, but we can predict regions that are more likely to have earthquakes than other regions, and regions that are potentially closer to having a very large earthquake than other regions. One of those seismic hotspots where earthquakes are likely is the Himalayas the biggest collision of plate tectonics happening on Earth today. The 
Himalayas have been formed over millions of years as the Indian subcontinent impinges upon Eurasia. This causes the mountains to rise as the Indian plate subducts beneath the Eurasian plate. The Indian plate doesn't really want to go down. It's quite, it's composed of light material. It doesn't want to go down beneath the Asian plate. Kashmir is disputed territory between India, Pakistan, and China. Its rugged mountainous landscape is dominated by the Himalayas and the tectonic stresses built up deep below. One October morning in 2005, Kashmir was slammed by a magnitude 7.6 earthquake. Unlike the strike slip quakes in Haiti and Northridge, this was an oblique slip with potentially more deadly ground movement. We are uh, doing all the rescue operation. There are people inside. The earthquake in Kashmir in 2005 was actually a mix of what we would call a thrust earthquake, one plate riding up over the other, and a strike-slip earthquake, one plate moving sideways. So an oblique earthquake is one that has elements of both. One side's rising, but it's also moving laterally. Kashmir was vulnerable because you had a large population center and you had a number of buildings that could not withstand strong shaking. Additionally, it was a mountainous region, so you can have landslides that can cover entire towns. We could see a lot of hilltops that were shattered. The buildings looked thoroughly disrupted. and. In many cases collapse. An estimated three million people were left homeless. More than 80,000 people perished. Of those killed, a staggering 19,000 were children. So typically the schools were load-bearing brick walls, quite heavy concrete slabs, often multiple stories, and even the roofs often were concrete slabs as well. So uh, what happened there was the timing was unfortunate because it was during uh, school time, the classrooms were full. The strategy basically they will have to dig into the building, we'll try to reach to the people and whatever we can find. The Kashmir earthquake was a watershed for change and in 2007 the building regulations did change. They align quite closely with world standard building regulations, notably the ones in the US, the Uniform Building Code. And then also there was an improved assessment of the seismic hazard in Pakistan because if you want to design for earthquakes you need to understand the likelihood of ground shaking. While tragedy may have forced change, the Himalayan region remains vulnerable to earthquakes, partly due to its remote and inaccessible nature. It can be extremely difficult because you have a lot of landslides which cover roads, which isolate towns. The only way to get resources in are via helicopters. 
and it can take a long time even to figure out how much damage has occurred in a, in a region like that. The magnitude 7.8 earthquake in Nepal in 2015 killed 9,000. More than three million were made homeless, with entire villages flattened. We just felt some fresh tremors here. Big pieces of ice came down from this glacier today. The quake triggered a disaster on Mount Everest when an avalanche swept into the base camp where several hundred climbers were staying. At least 19 people were killed, with 120 others injured or missing. More than 300 people disappeared after a landslide nearly two miles wide engulfed several villages in the Langtang Valley. Although hampered by heavy rainfall, landslides, and aftershock, Nepalese soldiers mobilized for search and rescue, managing to find survivors for a week after the earthquake. International teams, French, Polish, American, swung into action to assist. We were told that there's voices heard in a void space. We're gonna go out, hopefully locate that victim, and we're gonna go ahead and have the uh, rescue squad come in and help extricate that victim out of the hole. Five days after the quake, there was jubilation as 15-year-old Pemba Tamang was pulled free from the rubble of Kathmandu, unharmed. It's what we call an entombment. So he wasn't specifically crushed, but what he was was inside of a box, a box with the heavy concrete all around him. So we worked side by side with the local teams, and we were there to assist them in getting this victim out. The level of damage was deep and widespread. Many fear that destruction like this could become more common in Nepal. Across the Himalayas is what seismologists call a slip deficit, or a seismic gap. Without enough earthquakes to relieve the stress that's known to be accumulating between the tectonic plates, there is the potential that several very large and catastrophic quakes could be unleashed. A growing concern across Nepal. As these plates move past each other, they're not slipping, you know, stress builds up all along that plate boundary. Part of that plate boundary might rupture in a large earthquake, but then there'll be some parts of the boundary that didn't rupture. And so you have to wonder, well, what's happening there? The other more worrying situation is that it's accumulating energy. So if there's part of the plate boundary that's not slipping, that's referred to as a seismic gap. And so that Nepal earthquake occurred in a seismic gap. It didn't completely fill that gap. So it would be a mistake to think that has relieved all the stress and there won't be further earthquakes. Although Nepal's quake was devastating, earthquakes of that moment magnitude are fairly common. Each year, 14 magnitude 7 earthquakes and at least one magnitude 8 occur. But when it comes to rating earthquakes on their strength, what does the moment magnitude scale measure? Before the moment magnitude scale was developed in the 70s, we really relied on the amount of shaking that was observed in an earthquake to determine how big that earthquake is. It was a very simple measurement. 
the moment magnitude scale is important because it's proportional to the area of the fault that ruptured in that earthquake and also the amount that fault moved in the earthquake. And so it's a more physical measurement than simply looking at the shaking from the earthquake. Magnitude's a number that's logarithmic. And what that means is every time you step by a magnitude unit, you're increasing the motion by about a factor of 10 and the energy by about a factor of 30. At a magnitude of 7.8, Nepal's 2015 earthquake released about 16 times more energy than Haiti's magnitude 7 shock. But the strength of these devastating earthquakes pales in comparison to the largest in recorded history. The 1960 Valdivia earthquake hit Chile at a moment magnitude of 9.5 over 5,500 times stronger than Haiti. But the energy an earthquake releases does not always translate into human devastation. As the months rolled by, Haiti's vulnerability to disaster was exposed. Recovery was slow to start and, to this day, remains a work in progress. With so many unburied bodies, the conditions after the quake led to concerns of a disease epidemic. An outbreak arose from sewage discharging into a river, but from an unexpected source. And one of the most tragic things that came out of Haiti was that the UN contingent of soldiers that was sent in from Nepal set off a cholera epidemic that killed additional thousands of people and affected a high proportion of the entire population. Six years after the outbreak, cholera was still killing around 40 people every month. In 2017, about 800,000 people, 7% of the population, had been infected with cholera, and more than 9,000 Haitians had died. Although earthquakes are a natural part of life, that doesn't mean we should be complacent and unprepared. A lot of times we see that when there's a big earthquake, that's the wake-up call. But the wake-up call should just be knowing that you live in an area where earthquakes are common or can happen. How we build, where we live, and how we learn can be the difference between life and death. In Haiti, as in many, many parts of the less developed world. You have settlements springing up and growing in areas that are inherently hazardous. As our population explodes and the dangers earthquakes represent increase, our quest to understand and predict these events could save the lives of millions. I used to find earthquakes scientifically interesting and you see the damage that these earthquakes can cause you see the impact that they can have and they're, they're no longer to me a, a scientific curiosity they're really an enemy 